meeting of the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority will come to order. Um, welcome to all the folks who dropped in for the meeting. Uh, you should reflect in the minutes that uh, both member Zakharov and I are here. Um, I believe Kim is uh, present, okay, but remotely. Uh, which means that she will not have the opportunity to vote uh, on any of the items that we have today, uh, but will be able to at least uh, otherwise participate. Um, the first matter is approval of the agenda. I'll entertain a motion for approval. I will move to approve it. As and uh, su support and all in favor, aye. Uh, the agenda is approved. We also have approval of the March 2023 meeting minutes. Um, that I'm assuming you're also moving to approve. Yes. Let me make one comment to the individual who prepares the meeting minutes. I'm not going to suggest that they be revised in this instance, but it would be helpful from my perspective uh, for future minutes to have all members of the public who provided comment at the meetings, both their name recorded and if they had any identified affiliation with any uh, particular group also recorded. Um, I don't think that was reflected in the March 2023 mi minutes, but if we can do that going forward, I'd appreciate it. Um, and with that editorial comment, um, <laughs> I'll uh, entertain a vote to approve. All in favor? I'll favor. Aye. Uh, the minutes are approved. We're now on to old business, the first item of which is a presentation from Ray Howd regarding the MSCA responsibilities and oversight. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I provided the authority board with a 22-page um, memo outlining the various uh, responsibilities and oversight uh, obligations that are both in the statute and in the tunnel agreement. Um, that's my and it is an attorney-client privilege communication. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, there may be more uh, that this board uh, would like to see. And um, at this time, uh, if, the, if the authority wanted to release this document, it would have to vote to uh, waive the attorney-client privilege. And uh, if, if not, um, I certainly can do a, uh, uh, any subsequent memo or to address uh, precisely what this authority board would like. Okay. Uh, Member Dr. Off, did you have any comments with respect to this? Yes, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Ray, uh, for all the work that went into the memo uh, and the analysis of what statutorily or contractually uh, is there, uh, you know, explicitly, as it were, in terms of oversight. Um, I am wondering and I am thinking that the memo uh, should be enhanced, however, uh, in a way that allows the current board and future board members uh, to have a, maybe a better working idea as to what its oversight activities in practice, in fact, will and can look like. Uh, and by that, I mean each project has a life cycle. Uh, we are mid-project life cycle right now, and uh, the role uh, of the uh, board to a certain extent is defined by uh, the applicable statutes and the tunnel agreement, but there is some interstitial uh, silence. Uh, there is, um, uh, in my mind, uh, opportunities for oversight that may be implicit in the tunnel agreement and our authorities, and I think that it would be a good idea uh, to 
um, provide additional guidance as to how we are going to be operating and engaging uh, in that oversight in the real world over the life cycle of the project. Um, example, you know, how should we form our agendas? Uh, how should we be conducting business to ensure that risks are mitigated and that our oversight regarding those risks is what it should be uh, and that Michigan's interests uh, and, you know, the, the, the project's interests are fully protected? How do we interact with our counterparties, the, uh, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Enbridge itself, the public, um, and the like? I personally believe that, you know, your uh, enhancement or supplementation of a memo would be very helpful for me, pers for me, so I know the parameters of what is and is not appropriate. But also, it might be uh, appropriate to consider uh, memorialize that, memorializing your conclusions or recommendations uh, in uh, written procedures or bylaws that make it clearer uh, as to um, what specific oversight roles uh, this board has and how we will be playing them over the course or the life cycle of this project. Those are my thoughts. Um, again, that is not in any way to suggest that your memo did not pro provide a very helpful statutory and contractual foundation for oversight and clearly a lot of work went into it as I mentioned, uh, but I uh, uh, make my comments for the chair's consideration as well as uh, uh, member Webb. All right, I, I have a, a couple of observations, both based on what you said and uh, some thoughts that I had as well. Uh, the first was, as I understand it, the term mechanism is included in the statute, but has no statutory definition. Mm -hmm. um, typically in the past, when I have seen the term mechanism used, it's a it's in the context of providing financial insurance mechanism. That is for, say, creation or permitting of a hazardous waste facility. The entity that is obtaining the permit will have to post some type of financial assurance mechanism, either a bond or some other uh, method of assuring that financially they can meet the obligations that are contained within the permitted conduct. Here, I don't know what the term mechanism really means, and, and I would like to see supplementation of uh, the, the analysis that's been provided to include a discussion of that term. Uh, the second uh, is I don't know whether when this statute was introduced, my recollection is it was introduced in lame duck of a particular session of the state legislature a few years ago, whether it was simply introduced and passed with no modifications made anywhere in the legislative process. It would be helpful for me to know if there were specific amendments that were made to the statute between the time it was initially introduced and the time that it was enacted by the legislature. Because sometimes you learn things on how statutes are to be interpreted based upon their amendatory history. It's also possible that this was, since it was in a lame duck session, something that was simply introduced, passed, no modifications. I don't know but uh, I'd like to know if there was any amendatory history. The bylaws and procedures point uh, that Andy raised, um, I do think it would be helpful to start that process simply by looking at what I'll refer to as as uh, similarly situated authorities that are state governmental entities. Um, because that may give, and, and I, would, I would carve that out and have that as a separate thought process from, from this legal work. Um, and the, the first 
step in doing that, I think, is to look at what the rules of procedure and bylaws for other similarly situated authorities in the state are. I'm not saying it has to be exhaustive of every authority, um, but if we could look at a couple of different uh, somewhat analogous authorities as to whether they have rules of procedure and bylaws that may assist us in in looking at those issues and simply how we govern ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, related to that point is a different point and that is it's entirely conceivable to me that at some point the authority will make a decision that some group would challenge in litigation. Um, whether it's a interested third party, whether it's Enbridge, whether it's wh who knows who, uh, but it would be helpful uh, when we are making decisions to have an idea as to the manner in which, if they were to be challenged, those challenges would be uh, waged, and I'm talking about legal challenges filed in court, and in particular what I am interested in is whether decisions that we are made, that, that we make, are considered to be administrative decisions where the decisional record, so to speak, um, would would have the legal effect of being an administrative record that is uh, that is that delineates the confines of the judicial challenge. Um, I don't know whether that's the case, and and I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it would be helpful to at least have, at first blush, a, a, some thought on whether that's the case, because it has consequences as to how we create the, and, and compile the materials that form the bases of decisions that we make. Um, and, and well, I'll, I'll leave it at that right now. So, you know, the, the downside of generating a thoughtful uh, and well-written memo is that it gives us ideas for new thoughtful written memos. Um, and and the, the two things that I think I'd be interested to, in seeing by way of supplementation are, are specifically the term mechanisms and the, uh, the amendatory history if it exists. I would like to, separate and aside from that, I'd like as an, as an, an entirely different item that we can have maybe as an agenda item for our next session um, a compilation of some of the bylaws and procedures from other similarly situated authorities that we can look at that may give us some ideas as to uh, how we create similar governing mechanisms for ourselves. Um, that's it. In can, can I uh, yep. respond Go briefly ahead. to yours? Uh, first of all, I think they're all helpful comments and they're uh, you know, important, uh, you know, lines of inquiry. Uh, I look at this as a, at least two step process. The memo would be supplemented slash enhanced. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we would use the memo as well as the other research that you requested mm -hmm. about similarly situated authorities to craft, uh, those, uh, um, procedures and bylaws. Mm -hmm. uh, just so my comments are clear, I want to keep it really simple. Not necessarily the memo, but the goal. And that is, we're an oversight entity. And the question therefore is, how does an entity uh, which is charged with protecting the interests of Michigan residents uh, in a variety of ways, 
uh, with the resources that we do have and with the resources that we don't have, with the statutory authority that we have and with the contractual rights that we have and with the ambiguities and the silences in the contract that exist, how do we do our jobs? Uh, and what does that look like and feel like in terms of our exercising oversight, which I look at as being watchful, um, intentional, uh, proactive, uh, interaction uh, with other stakeholders uh, and project participants uh, to ensure that this project, uh, you know, assuming per permitting uh, is, is achieved, um, is done right in a way that, again, protects all interests and mitigates the risks uh, fully. Uh, and I want, if not a map or, a, or, or something that shows me how to dance step by step, something that lays out where uh, and when we should be playing what roles as an oversight entity. Um, and I want you know, that role or those roles to be understood and defined by the authority that is there and the silences uh, in uh, you know the statutes uh, as well as the tunnel agreement that uh, give latitude to playing an appropriately reasonable robust role in uh, performing that oversight okay um, based on the comments Ray do you have sufficient guidance on taking a crack at the the supplementation in the areas that Andy and I have spoken about? I do, and okay. I think uh, if there are any questions that uh, I could, I do uh, understand, uh, and if I do have any questions, I could reach out to um, either you or, or okay. Andy. Okay. Dr. And Dr. again, just, I don't know, I wanna make this clear, I think that any analysis should, should be broken down by steps in the life cycle. Our oversight will mean different things at different times over the life cycle of the project. Um, and uh, so it's not like, you know, our oversight stays the same. So any distillation of our oversight responsibilities and opportunities would be, um, uh, you know, grafted onto uh, an analysis of the project's life cycle. Uh, one question, uh, it, I did not address the um, obligations and responsibilities that is in, that is in the lease agreement. Is that something when we get to that point that you'd like to see broken down? Yeah, okay. I, because it's, I consider that personally part of the project's mm -hmm. life cycle. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I think of it that way. It's a milestone. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. All right, um, unless we have other comments on that, uh, we can move along to third-party utilities. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I brought this uh, issue up um, in general in the past, um, but I think this is fairly new to the two new board members. Um, under the tunnel agreement, um, section 3.3, .3, the uh, authority may enter into use agreements for the use of the tunnel. And the uh, uh, it's dictated by um, Schedule one, which is third party utility access. And there is a process um, uh, which I've laid out in my memo um, on page, uh, let's see here. Well, that process is that a, a, a third party utility that's interested in uh, leasing space within the tunnel would indicate, um, uh, they would notify uh, either Enbridge and or the authority uh, who in turn will bring uh, both on board. So if the authority gets noticed, then it would give uh, Enbridge notice of that. There would be an informal discussion uh, where you would talk about the scope of use. Uh, it could not interfere with Enbridge's um, uh, uh, tunnel or its uh, replacement line segment. Um, the third party would be responsible for the tunnel operation and maintenance fees uh, that would be determined by Enbridge that would reflect 
uh, the cost of the use to um, maintain the uh, tunnel and the utilities within the tunnel. Um, also, they have to, uh, the, the third party utility, uh, if in fact uh, their um, layout of their utility, excuse me, utility uh, would cause any change in the design, it's up to Enbridge to determine whether or not they would approve having that third party utility um, um, take up our lease space within the tunnel. Uh, there's a provision that uh, there should be no loss of net profit to the Mackinac Bridge Authority. And um, in discussing earlier with the Mackinac Bridge Authority, um, their thought is that they don't make a profit and uh, so that is an issue that has to be ironed out more uh, with the Mackinac Bridge Authority, which does own fiber optic utility lines that cross the Mackinac Bridge, and uh, they do lease it out to various entities. Um, if after that informal discussion uh, is uh, the third party is still interested in moving forward, then um, Schedule 1 lays out the procedure. Uh, they would um, set forth the, uh, what their use is, um, they provide uh, the uh, agree to pay the maintenance reserve account established and um, would also um, uh, be ready to enter into an agreement. At that point, then, the, uh, if it, off, after all of those steps, then the prospect of third party uh, would enter into negotiations and it's, all, it's up to the authority to um, prepare a draft, uh, it's a negotiated contract, um, and Enbridge, uh, at the end of it, has the authority to um, veto authority, if you will, and uh, then finally, ultimately, this uh, board would approve or reject an agreement that would be brought to the, to the board. So, uh, Peninsula Fiber Network, early on, indicated an interest, followed all the steps, and over the last uh, year and a half or so, uh, uh, we've been negotiating um, also with uh, Enbridge's attorney on various draft language. Um, uh, the requirement of the third party agreement is that it complies with all provisions of the tunnel agreement, um, Public Act uh, 359, and th the tunnel lease, and so um, that that is what we've been using as a baseline to negotiate the draft that we have so far. The reason, uh, aside from just giving you a background um, with the negotiations and that this third party utility agreement is um, uh, being negotiated, is that PFN has requested uh, exclusivity, if you will. Um, they uh, would like a provision in there that they would be the only uh, fiber optic company to place their um, fiber optic cables within the facility. They would do it on a non-discriminatory basis uh, and uh, they would charge standard rates to third parties and, um, and uh, not discriminate. Uh, they would grant, um, well, and so the, they're asking that the authority not grant to any other third party utility the right to place fiber optic in the, in the tunnel until such time as all of their strands have been uh, leased out. Um, so that is where we're at. Uh, we've, uh, I've asked um, Eric Fredericks from the Office of High Speed Internet in, um, in the LEO department to provide a presentation and be available for questions just to give an overview of the fiber optic industry. And uh, I, I would turn it over to him at this time, unless there's any questions, um, but we'll get, we can get back to this language um, yeah. maybe after we hear what, um, what Mr. Fredericks has to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hold questions until after we hear from Mr. Fredericks. Yes. I'm going to share my screen as well to do the show presentation. Is that coming through okay as well? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning. Um, 
thank you for having me here today uh, to discuss uh, some of the, the fiber optic work uh, in Michigan um, and give you uh, kind of a, a primer on middle mile networks um, in fiber optics and then some of the work of our office to expand high speed internet in the state. Um, like Ray said, I'm the Chief Connectivity Officer for the State of Michigan. I run the Michigan High Speed Internet Office. We are located within the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Um, we were created by Executive Directive in 2021, uh, but not receive uh, funding and authorization for staff until mid-2022. So we are a relatively new office, um, but I have been working in this space for the last 12 years uh, to expand high-speed internet um, infrastructure and adoption in the state of Michigan. So a little bit of primer on our office again. Uh, our mission at the high-speed internet office is to create a more digitally equitable state where everyone can leverage technology to improve their quality of life. This means making sure uh, primarily that the infrastructure is there to connect every home, business, and institution in the state uh, to a high-speed connection. Um, we have a goal of ensuring universal availability um, and working to address issues of affordability, uh, access to devices, digital literacy training and skills training, quality technical support, um, and applications and online content then that enable that improvement of quality of life um, for however somebody might see fit to do that. Uh, so we have a pretty broad mission, um, but a very specific goal, and again, achieving universal availability. There have been gaps in high-speed internet infrastructure across the state that have persisted for a number of years. However, we have funding coming from the federal government to address those gaps. Um, just a quick summary of the three primary programs that we operate here in our office. Our Robin Grant program is our first grant. We have $238 million uh, to award to uh, internet service providers to build new infrastructure to unserved areas. We received requests for $1.3 billion in this space um, for the $238 million we have available. So just, just as a, a way of, of illustrating the, the interest there is in this space to expand um, high-speed internet to our unserved locations in the state. The BEAD program is coming next. This is a program of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, that was passed in 2021. Um, this program is designed to connect those very last uh, locations that have been unserved. Uh, while we don't know our allocation in this program yet, it's going to definitely be north of a billion dollars uh, where we will then issue grants to internet service providers um, and a, a myriad of other entity types to expand service into those unserved and underserved areas. And then finally, we have digital equity planning and capacity grants that are allowing us to address really non-infrastructure issues related to high-speed internet, so affordability, devices, digital literacy, and skills, and so on. So as you can see, we, we are involved in a number of different programs um, and have a, a, a wide range of resources that are coming uh, to address the high-speed internet gap in the state. So I want to talk a little bit about what those networks look like, particularly when it comes to middle mile. So Peninsula Fiber Network is a primarily a middle mile uh, network carrier. That means that they provide um, transport of internet traffic from last mile internet service providers to the broader internet, to cloud provider data centers, uh, and so on. So whenever a home, a business, or an institution is connected to the internet, it is often done through a local access network. Um, you know, those are, these are the, the name brand companies that you're familiar with when it comes to internet service providers um, that provide, again, consumer level internet. Uh, Comcast, Charter, AT&T, you, you name it, there's, there's many of them in the state. Um, but to get those, those connections from, from our communities back to the broader internet, they need transport fiber, middle mile fiber, that they then co-locate with in a facility and then lease space on a network to then transport that fiber. Uh, transport that traffic back, back to the broader internet. And this usually comes in the form, again, of fiber optic internet cabling. So I've included a diagram of a, a fiber optic cable here, and this is a very small example. Um, usually in a sheath of fiber like this, you'll have 12 different lines. However, these sheaths can be bundled together, and oftentimes we see fiber optic cables being laid that have multiples of 12 in them, uh, 144 strand, 256 strand, um, which means that they have th that many individual fibers inside that can be connected to it. So when we think about the, um, the Straits fiber line here, um, I put this diagram together just to illustrate how this might work. So on the lower peninsula side um, of the Straits, you would have multiple carriers coming into what's called a co-location facility. Again, this is where they interconnect with um, their uh, the cloud services with all their transport fiber to carry traffic to and from the internet. So you'd have traffic coming in, 
um, and out of that lower peninsula co-location facility it would go into a single fiber strand in the straits um, that can that is leased individual strands to those carriers or multiple strands depending on how much traffic they need and then come out the other side on the upper peninsula where then that carrier can move that traffic to wherever they need to whether it's a community facility up in newbury that they're connecting or marquette or even further uh, beyond that but this would provide um, an opportunity to interconnect um, uh, under the straits through this single fiber line so a single fiber line that's used for middle mile transport like this uh, can can um, be leased to multiple carriers because those individual fiber lines can be leased um, to those carriers for their traffic needs. Uh, sometimes if it's a large user, they might lease more than one strand, two strands, three strands um, on up, depending on how much capacity that they need. But essentially you have two facilities on either side um, of the straits that would be a co-location facility where they can interconnect with other, with other internet service providers or themselves as they then transport that traffic in that single fiber line um, under the straits. So um, more than this was a, a quick primer, but more than happy to take any questions you might have um, on either how this um, uh, how the, the this normal leasing operation structure works, um, or more broadly about the high speed internet capacity in the state. I I have a couple questions, um, Eric and. Some of these might be more appropriate to the company than you, but the first question I have is PFN vertically integrated forward into also providing land services? Or are they solely, I think the term you used is middle mile provider, are they solely competing in the middle mile space? Um, that, that definitely would be a question for them. It's my understanding that their primary line of business is middle mile transport fiber, um, although I believe that they do have um, and provide some last mile connectivity to institutions primarily, um, but I'm not sure if they do provide uh, last mile service to individual consu uh, consumers. Okay. Um, but their, their business model is mostly middle mile fiber. And, and I think you may understand from hearing Ray speak about it earlier, that one of the things they have requested as part of uh, receiving authorization to place fiber optic cable within the tunnel is that they be granted exclusivity until such time as the capacity that they have installed has been consumed, essentially. Um, does LEO have a position on whether that's appropriate from their perspective? Uh, Leo does not have a position on that at this time. No. Okay. Um, I, I guess the third question I have, because you, you stated it or uh, outlined some of the funding that is becoming available from primarily the federal level for purposes of uh, addressing fiber optic needs and high speed speed internet needs in underserved areas. Um, are there specific geographic areas within the state that LEO has identified as being those primarily underserved areas? And if so, is there a map or, or some delineation as to where those areas are? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. We are in a period of working to identify those areas. So because this funding is coming from the federal government, uh, we, um, we are beginning to use the new Federal Communications Commission National Broadband Map to identify those areas. So we have some preliminary data on where these unserved and underserved areas are. And they're in the areas, you would imagine, uh, lots of rural communities that uh, where the infrastructure just has not existed uh, over the years. Uh, but as we work with the federal government and our funders to um, identify those areas, we will be publishing a map uh, likely in the first of next year um, that will help us identify where those areas are, refine that data and map, and then finally in Q2 of next year have a, a, a definitive map of the areas that we are allowed to fund with the, with the resources that are coming um, that are unserved and underserved. So the, the short answer is we are in process of creating that map. We do have some resources that show uh, where these, where we believe these unserved and underserved areas are, but we will have um, an official map uh, early in 2024. Um, I, I understand from your prior answer that Leo hasn't taken a position, 
but can you articulate for me in your view what some of both the advantages and potential disadvantages would be of a grant of exclusivity to PFN for purposes of running through the straits? So the, the concept as I understand it is to build an open access network. And that means open access means that any carrier, any other even competing carrier could come and interconnect to that network um, in a non-discriminatory fashion. Um, as long as the fiber that is going under the straits is of capacity enough to handle any potential traffic um, and, any, and any potential interconnector that would want to, to lease that fiber on that space, I don't know that it's a capacity issue. Um, I don't necessarily have an opinion on the exclusivity piece, but from my, under, from my needs to connect everyone in the state, we want to make sure that there is capacity there uh, because we know that there's going to be lots of investment coming to build these new last mile connections in parts of the state that have not had those connections before. And so that's going to require um, more robust and, and high capacity middle mile networks to make those connections. Have, have you made any projections as to what types of capacity envisioning the growth in the market that is facilitated by some of the last mile subsidization that is coming? Um, what type of capacity would be an appropriate amount, at least to start with, uh, for purposes of installing through the tunnel? Yep, and that's part of our process that right now that we're working to refine uh, where those areas are so we can do that type of analysis, so we don't currently have that yet. Okay. Andy, did you have questions? Yeah, I did. And first of all, I thank you for those questions because they get to the heart of what I'm thinking as well. Uh, when I think about this exclusivity issue, or you know, a, a, a less uh, friendly word, uh, this uh, this uh, regional monopoly, um, you know, potential. I have two questions. One is, what will the law, statutory case law, allow under these circumstances? I mean, we all know that there's a lot of gray in antitrust law. Um, uh, leaving aside contractual obligations that are implicit in the tunnel agreement or explicit, but what would the law say about a grant of exclusivity uh, here? Um, and I think before this panel could weigh in on uh, that, uh, this question about exclusivity, we need, we need to have a fundamental understanding as to the likelihood of any decision violating the law. Um, and then the second question I have is, assuming there's a lot of gray in this area and there's some discretion here, uh, as your questions, Mr. Chairman, were getting at, what are the costs and benefits of a grant of exclusivity here? Uh, you know, uh, what are the risks of not doing uh, an exclusive deal? Uh, how much uh, competition would we be uh, freezing out that actually would exist? Uh, is this one of those markets or one of these areas in this middle mile area where, you know, any provider couldn't uh, economically in a viable way uh, provide services were it not granted uh, exclusive rights uh, here. Uh, I think that uh, any decision uh, along these lines would have to look at those issues and we would have to have a conversation with uh, PFN about its motives uh, for asking for, demanding uh, exclusivity. Uh, and I guess my question to you, Ray, is, is that the type of analysis you feel comfortable making, recognizing that this does encroach upon areas of the law that require real expertise and specialization antitrust? It's, it's a difficult area. Um, so uh, what do you think? Yeah, that certainly was not my area um, of law uh, practicing, but I'm, um, you know, I certainly feel comfortable uh, uh, looking into the basics of the antitrust mm -hmm. law, and then if it does get into some real gray areas, then yeah, I would I would consult with somebody in the attorney general's yeah. office. Or See, I, I don't think that we would want to be approving, uh, you know, exclusive uh, contractual uh, rights that uh, is subject to clear legal challenge. Um, I guess my question to you, Ray, since you've been dealing with PFN is what has it been saying about its request, I don't know whether it's a demand, uh, for exclusivity? Uh, how have they 
or how has it justified this request? Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> if I could, Member Dr. Hoff, <clears throat> Chairman, um, I guess I'd like to back up to help give a little color on how this, how we got here. Yeah. Uh, in brief, um, PFN has been the only utility that has proposed to um, locate in the tunnel other than, than Enbridge. Um, they're the only third party utility that's approached the, the authority. Um, my immediate reaction to the exclusivity was no. And then recognizing our lack of expertise, we said we need to engage others within state government and Eric was good enough to, to come today. So I think um, exactly the, the, the um, issue that you've raised is what we need to explore before we can consider the, the proposed agreement with PFN. So what I would suggest, and didn't mean to jump in front of you, Ray, I just wanted to, to, to offer that kind of history, uh, would be to engage uh, Leo in further dialogue of the, about this, because from a transportation perspective, it would be uncommon. Um, sometimes temporary exclusivity is granted for something that's new and emerging, um, and otherwise would be commercially infeasible. Um, you would offer right of first first refuser, right of first refusal or right of first offer, <clears throat> but to grant exclusivity would be unusual. So again, that's why it made me uncomfortable. However, it may be that to provide the services that Eric may tell us are necessary for the public benefit, it may be commercially infeasible to to provide those without the exclusivity. That's that's where we're trying to to dig a little deeper. Um, so that's why Eric's been, um, expertise <clears throat> has been requested. So I think um, last thing I'll say is I'd like a little bit of um, further dialogue with Eric to understand how common that middle mile exclusivity is. If, um, and then secondly, what their legal advisors would, would tell them in such a, a case and maybe Ray can partner with them. Yeah, and, and again, if no one feels comfortable saying anything in response, if no one feels comfortable saying anything in response to this question, that's great. And I understand certain conversations may have been confidential, uh, but I am curious as to what PFN has said to justify its request for exclusivity. Um, yes, Member Dr. Off. They have indicated that um, to invest in this infrastructure to have um, another provider also um, uh, put in the infrastructure that it would not be um, cost effective for them, that they, they would not get the return on investment uh, if there were two uh, cables. To date, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. And this will be my final question. Has there been any showing uh, to support that contention or has it been made in kind of a conclusory way uh, without support? I have not seen the support. I, I would add that um, this presentation was going to be given to the um, at the last meeting that was postponed mm -hmm. prior to the uh, board the new board members taking uh, their positions and um, PFN was going to give their presentation as well but because of the agenda we had today uh, the uh, the thought was that okay. we'd at least just start this conversation, but I would certainly uh, think that PFN would want to make its presentation to this board. Yeah, they, they Thank you. And, and just to be clear, I mean, in some respects, this type of, of structured segment of the economy is one that shares a lot of attributes of what economists characterize as natural monopolies. Um, very similar to the transmission and distribution lines for electric facilities. It makes no sense to have, for example, two separate transmission systems for electricity going to individual homes on the same lines of poles, the same uh, facilities that are utilized. I don't know whether this, this type of area fits neatly within that same characterization, 
but it's possible that it does and if it does um, economists would argue that it is pro-competitive to have a structured um, exclusivity provision provided that uh, the access to those facilities um, are treated essentially as essential facilities, meaning that there are some obligations that would be recognized for the entity that's being granted exclusivity to treat uh, other entities that request access to the essential facilities fairly. Typically, that is done by using language in the contract that imposes an obligation that they treat all entities requesting access to the essential facility in a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory manner, or FRAND. Um, and this language is close to, uh, to that, although it doesn't um, include the fair and reasonable uh, terms, only the non-discriminatory one. Um, but there are a couple things that I think we need to know as predicates. By the way, this gets back easily to the discussion you had earlier about bylaws and rules of procedure, et cetera. We really need to uh, draft, I think, a set of operating procedures for any other utility that requests access to the tunnel um, so that we have a, a basic set of principles. You've articulated some of those principles as they are laid out and governed by both the statute and the contract um, with Enbridge, um, but it seems to me we should have those clearly set out um, as, as procedures be, because I'm assuming that PFN is not going to be the last utility in, in some manner or another uh, requests access. And we also need to have a discussion with Enbridge about their views on available capacity um, and uh, how they envision the utilization of that capacity would be facilitated. Um, so first, kudos to, to PFN for being ahead of the game in anticipating a lot of issues that uh, we are dealing with for the first time. That also means that they are at the disadvantage that we are dealing with all those issues for the first time with them, um, which means you're getting the benefit and also the disadvantage of us trying to kick around all of these different competing considerations um, and you're the guinea pig under which all of those things are being discussed. Um, so that's, those are all the observations I have for now. I, I guess um, there, there is one antitrust issue that would arise. I, I don't think there's that significant of an antitrust issue in terms of granting exclusivity for this stretch of capacity that assumes that there are still competing providers that either, um, or I guess once this tunnel is built, are we envisioning that all fiber optics that are strewn currently across the bridge are going to be displaced by this tunnel? Or that there will still be fiber optic lines that that run across the bridge my understanding is that it would be a redundancy and that it would increase capacity okay that's important that's fact. that's uh, significant um in in terms of any issues associated with the exclusivity grant i think it's significant too yeah <laughs> in this case i would add that it's redundant but the prohibition of affecting the mackinac bridges um operating income is intended to um, discourage 
um, an immediate displacement of those utilities into the utility, the, the utility tunnel. I'll also say that just to clarify the um, exclusivity, it would be for a term until such time as the capacity was. So it's right. not a uh, um, perpetual monopoly, so to speak. So just to really briefly talk about the economic um, analysis that you were discussing a little bit, um, to your point, you wouldn't want two sewer companies operating in the middle of the road down Main right. Street, right? That's why typically um, a monopoly can be a good thing for the public benefit. In this case, there's already a tunnel that will be there. So there doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily have that dig once um, kind of um, challenge. However, again, I think the, the important thing here is the commercial feasibility of two and I think this company appears to be barring against that um, commercial feasibility challenge. You know, look, these are all important concepts. And I think, uh, as the chairperson's uh, comments suggest, as mine, uh, notwithstanding these impressions, which are maybe controlling and ultimately are determinative, uh, there should be a legal analysis as to a grant of exclusivity and a uh, analysis as to the uh, pluses and minuses, um, you know, of, of, of doing so from the perspective of uh, the consumer or the market. Um, it may be that this is uh, a natural monopoly, or yeah, it's probably not the right word, but uh, akin to that. I just personally, before voting for something, I'd like to see an analysis so uh, I could feel comfortable. And to be clear, we weren't asking for any vote for decision today. I just wanted to, right. uh, frankly, um, come to you all admitting our lack of expertise yeah. here and probably suggesting more time with right. Eric and his folks. And Eric, did you have any kind of, and, and apologize for asking a question, but um, just wanted you to weigh in on that concept of exclusivity, how common it is, if you could. So I don't have any specific examples of exclusivity in similar situations. Um, we certainly see um, multiple uh, uh, middle mile providers in the state of Michigan um, that build networks where they find market. I mean, the internet service up until this investment from the federal government has primarily been market driven. Um, and so where there is a market for more middle mile transport, certainly there are more providers in this space. Um, but I don't have necessarily a, an example that really fits this model um, of exclusivity at this point. Okay. Um, one thing I would like us to do as we continue to look at this particular thing is circle back with the Mackinac Bridge Authority and formalize their position with respect to displaced revenue um, and whether they would expect uh, using the statutory language that governs any obligation that this authority would have to make sure that that displaced revenue is covered, um, we, we would need to get their position on the extent or even whether, in their view, any revenue needs to be covered in whatever arrangements that we make. Well, that's enough to give a heads up to PFN as to the conversation and maybe some of this, the, the items um, that, that would be up for discussion. I, I will say there is one thing that a grant of exclusivity in and of itself doesn't, doesn't give me huge problems but one thing that is of concern would be doing so without having first provided some opportunity for any competitors in the middle mile space to understand that there is an opportunity to invest in facilities that would exist within the tunnel. Um, so that if there are any entities that are interested in doing so, 
that they have an understood timeline by which they would have to express their interest in doing so um, or uh, you know we we would effectively uh, cut off their ability to do so if we grant exclusivity to an initial company that uh, would provide that capacity at least through the segment uh, that that goes under the under the straits. Are we done with that one? <laughs> All right. Next up is the Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. Oh, oh. Eric, Eric Hurt. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is the Army Corps of Engineers NEPA status update. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is continuing to prepare the environmental impact statement. EIS and is currently identifying sc the scope, purpose, and need statement and potential alternative alternatives that they will analyze in, as part of the study. This summer or fall, late summer, fall of 2023, the Corps will review the data collected to prepare the draft EIS, um, and that will take place in 2024 per the Corps' posted schedule if you've not seen it. Um, Enbridge has continued to participate in the EIS process, supporting permit review through um, data request responses um, in, in, in response to the Corps' request for information and uh, continuing uh, to perform field surveys. Uh, the Corps' posted schedule indicates a targeted conclusion of the EIS process with the record of decision in 2026. Early 2026 is now their schedule. Okay. For conclusion. I have a quick question, either Ryan for you or an Enbridge individual, if they, if they want, to uh, provide an answer, and that is, is the timing of an EIS process related to this proposed facility impacted at all? by the legislation that is, what, 48 hours old now uh, with respect to expedited environmental permitting reviews is part of the debt ceiling statute that was signed on, what, Saturday, I think? <laughs> and if you guys just want to wave off and say, it's, it's been 48 hours, we, <laughs> we haven't had a chance yet, that's, that's fine. Uh, and I see heads nodding, which says, okay, uh, it it's might be a little too soon to, to give a legal analysis of that. But uh, let me identify that as an item for future discussion, because I would like to know the company's position on whether anything that was enacted uh, at the federal level in their view will impact the schedule for the EIS process. Anything else on that uh, agenda item? Any discussion? Yeah, a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, I want to echo uh, my concern or interest in that issue as well. Um, no question about it. Uh, when I read that, I wondered about immediately its applicability to our situation. And uh, if you could figure out, or Ryan, uh, you could get an answer to us on that uh, as soon as possible, because uh, the implications uh, you know, of the answer are quite significant in terms of the timing of this project uh, and the ability to protect the you know, interests of the lakes and the state. Uh, so um, that's a very, you know, in my mind, top of the agenda item. Um, I have a question uh, for you, Ryan, though. Broadly speaking, um, well, not broadly speaking here, was the Army Corps of Engineers invited to attend today to present uh, where uh, it is when it comes to the NEPA EIS process? Andy, I did reach out and did not receive a response, but I will follow up with them and invite them to future meetings to present this status regularly. I think that'd be 
how much visibility do we as a body, do you, uh, have into uh, what the Army Corps of Engineers is doing uh, uh, as part of the NEPA slash EIS process? We, we have not engaged um, with the Corps as a partner agency. Um, we've had limited interaction. What do you, Ryan, think the appropriate role of the MSCA is vis-a-vis -vis the EIS and our partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that uh, the EIS is done as expeditiously and as effectively as possible? I think it's significant. I think we should be, um, in my view, ha have a um, have a view to that and have a dialogue, an open dialogue. What steps do you think, concrete steps do you think, need to be taken in order to um, make sure that the relationship is established as we need it to be and the role uh, is being performed in the way that you and I think we collectively think that it should be? Well, what I can commit to, Member Dr. Off, is to um, persist in making that contact and then confer with my um, counterpart at the core at the Detroit division and then um, request that that regular contact and that meaningful interaction begins. And my final question is, without speaking for the core, of course, and uh, perfectly appreciating the good faith in which they are, I'm sure, acting, do you know, uh, without speaking for the core and always assuming that it's acting in utter good faith with due diligence. Uh, do you know what its position is as to um, its partnering with us and keeping us engaged uh, as part of the NEPA slash EIS process? I do not, Member Dr. Off. However, the Mackinac Straits Court Authority made a conscious decision to not co-apply for the core permit. Mm -hmm. That was an Enbridge application. So it's, it's not that they're um, excluding us, it's that um, we've, been, we've not been directly involved to date. However, given, and to your point, the impact of their work on this agency, I think it's appropriate that we increase that and, and um, intentionally establish a, a more open dialogue. Uh, and I guess in light of that answer, a final question to Enbridge, and I know you're gonna be presenting a little bit later. Uh, do you have an opinion on this? in terms of our role uh, in the EIS process with the Army Corps of Engineers and to what extent we should or should not be working with Enbridge uh, to make sure uh, that the EIS process goes as uh, efficiently as possible. No, it's fine with me if it's fine with you, Mr. Chairperson. Yeah, that's fine. Hi, thank you, Anna Mooney with Enbridge Government Relations. So um, I think we are open to and would you know, welcome your participation as Ryan and Ray indicated. Um, when we did apply back in 2020, there was a discussion, I believe, about whether or not it was appropriate for the, uh, or um, interest by the Corridor Authority to be a joint applicant. Um, we do have regular meetings with the Army Corps, uh, I think biweekly, if not more frequent. So there's certainly a dialogue that's frequent on our end and something we would welcome um, your participation and if there's interest. Can you, Ann, uh, give any insight into uh, the Army Corps of Engineers or Enbridge's thinking about the current timeline um, before the legislation was passed uh, and how things are going generally? Yeah, so I'll answer maybe your uh, initial question too about uh, that legal analysis of the legislation. We're certainly something we're talking about and we're happy to get you an answer through Ryan and Ray here as quickly as possible on our legal analysis of how that may or may not impact our permitting. Um, yeah, I think so as our March meeting uh, was right before uh, the Corps had extended their uh, permitting uh, timeline, as was Ryan indicated, that's publicly available on their website. Um, certainly we are ready uh, to move forward on the tunnel. We, we'd like to have our permits in hand as soon as possible. I think you'll hear later about our contracting schedule and where, where we are in that uh, process as well. 
Um, I think again, as Ryan indicated, um, you know, the cores, uh, they're the best entity to talk about why uh, the timeline is what it is. But um, I think given, uh, as they've noted, the comments that they've received, we certainly are open to a, you know, robust, transparent uh, permitting process that they want to have uh, as well would be, you know, defensible. Um, however, we've been working, uh, I think as also indicated a reminder that we applied in April of 2020 for that permit. Um, we applied at the same time for our state permit with Eagle, and we received that in February of 21. So, um, you know, within that eight to nine month window, uh, we worked um, expeditiously and, and efficiently with our uh, feedback with the core. Um, any information requests that we've received have been timely submitted on our end, and so uh, we really look forward to uh, having those permits in hand and continuing to collaborate with the core and, and stakeholders. Without asking you to speak for the core. Uh, do you have any insights into um, why it extended uh, the date by which it expects to complete the EIS and obtain an ROD, Record of Decision? Yeah, I can't give any further insight to what the Corps has already stated in that. They're looking at uh, the 18,000, which are you know both positive or supportive and, and maybe against the permit. Um, and I think their um, um, ability to judiciously look through those comments and consider all uh, interested parties in the discussion, but I don't have uh, any other technical reasons or uh, within our, you know, our surveys are continuing on our end uh, that we can do and, and really any of the groundwork that we are able to do seasonally, we are, but. Obviously, en Enbridge is a very sophisticated provider of infrastructure and infrastructure related services. And therefore, given your portfolio in the United States, I assume that Enbridge is quite familiar with NEPA and the EIS process or the EA process. Um, are you able to, um, based on your experience or the company's uh, experiences, assess whether uh, comparable projects uh, have uh, a, a NEPA process that is uh, as long as this one is, uh, or is this par for the course? Yeah, I'd have to get back with you on the specific. Or not part for the course. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, as also a reminder, I think was covered, or at least in prior conversations, we're talking about less than a quarter of an acre of wetland that's being impacted. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everything, the design that was gone into the tunnel and the construction um, has been to have a minimal uh, environmental impact as possible. And so Enbridge has done anything, everything that we can, um, you know, with the technical expertise to ensure that. Um, I can't speak to another project that's had a, a similar um, projected timeline on permitting. Um, I think like any large piece of <laughs> critical infrastructure and improvements to our infrastructure, we, we would all like to see some predictability in, um, in permitting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you know, what role, if any, has EGLE taken in the uh, provision of information to the core as part of the core's evaluation of the EIS? Um, I'd have to get back with you for sure on that, but I believe, um, you know, any of the information that was shared during the um, EGLE process and permitting has been shared with the Army Corps as well, um, if that's what you're referring to. I, I don't know that there's, um, I can't speak to the fact that there's communication with EGLE and the Corps, but if I'm wrong, I'll be happy to get back with you on that. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm really trying to identify is whether other than, you know, the, the record and the permitting decisions that EGLE made, and providing all of that information over to the core, whether Eagle has taken any affirmative steps on top of that to take a position or to state its analysis in particular areas um, where, where they've taken a specific uh, position or, or provided uh, their views on aspects of the project. Yeah, we certainly would welcome that, um, showing the, the due diligence they did. And, in finding approval for the permits. I don't know that that type of affirmative or um, a proactive maybe uh, conversation is taking place. But again, if that's something that I'm wrong about, I'm happy to correct the record. Okay. On. Yep. Other than the providing of information, does the state play a role um, in the EIS process? Um, I, I, you think technically in the process as a party with I don't is, believe. Is yeah. there any role that the state is playing or normally would play? 
Um, I, I think as the authority being that oversight, uh, the state on behalf of you know this being a state-owned uh, tunnel at the end of the day, um, I think as a cooperating agency maybe, um, I don't know that we've seen anything directly from the, to maybe to your point, from the administration um, or from EGLE to that point, but okay. yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to add that the state Historic Preservation Office has been engaged by the U.S. Army Corps to determine if there are any historic resources and how they would be impacted by the project, but. Yep, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Ryan, are you familiar with any other MDOT projects that have been uh, recent examples of EIS um, uh, permitting review by the Army Corps? Um, yes. Okay. Um, and in those instances, has MDOT itself um, participated in the EIS review? And, and can you describe just generically the manner of their participation? Um, well, depending on the infrastructure, MDOT may have been or would likely have been the permit applicant, and so they would have performed in the role that Enbridge is serving in okay. this case, which would be not the author necessarily of the EIS, but a key contributor to the EIS. Okay. All right, did you have anything else on no. that? Our next item is construction, con oh wait, I skipped one. Project life cycle risks and mitigations. Uh, MPSC. I skipped two. <laughs> status of MPSC contested case proceedings. <laughs> I just moved the agenda. <laughs> yes, yeah, so as I um, updated the, the board uh, last time in March, um, in July of 2022, the Public Service Commission reopened the record uh, to take additional evidence on um, a variety of areas. Uh, we, requested documents from Enbridge to establish that, in fact, the um, uh, re placing the Line 5 replacement segment within the tunnel would be a more environmentally sound alternative to leaving the dual pipelines in the straits. And so Enbridge provided uh, that documentation um, to satisfy the uh, PSC's um, request. The second part related to possible explosions um, and ultimate leaking of product into the straits. And the testimony uh, took place uh, between um, April 11th and April 14th. There was cross-examination. Paul's familiar with the uh, strange animal that the PSC proceedings are. The testimony gets filed and then uh, there is live uh, cross-examination uh, by the witnesses. And so the competing testimony was uh, Enbridge and the Public Service Commission staff um, ultimately uh, felt that the um, uh, risk analysis that was performed by Enbridge's expert uh, that showed that a release uh, in the pipeline would be unlikely uh, one in 663,000 years um, and that uh, it, would ha it would take, um, the probability would be even higher to have an ignition source uh, simultaneous with the release. If there was an explosion, the um, polypropylene um, uh, strands that would be part of the concrete tunnel lining would withstand um, a normal blast and that ultimately the hydrostatic pressure would prevent any uh, release from the tunnel into the straits. And in fact, it would take two full days of a full um, Enbridge pipeline blow up to fill that tunnel uh, after it's constructed. And uh, so Enbridge focused on its um, uh, safety mechanisms, the automatic shutoff shut valves, the sensors that are in the, uh, that will be in the tunnel, uh, and the, uh, and other provisions. Um, Bay Mills uh, disagrees with that, and they submitted evidence that uh, there is methane that could be an ignition source, that a tunnel blast would be such that uh, it could 
um, damage the concrete tunnel lining and that there would be um, the potential for uh, a leak of product into the straits. Uh, the parties uh, submitted briefs, the authority did not, um, and uh, also response briefs. It is now before the commission to make a decision uh, on, on Enbridge's application. Uh, there's one other area, um, Bay Mills has, um, there was a motion, they filed a motion to strike claiming that the uh, data in support of Enbridge's um, uh, probability analysis uh, was flawed and they moved to strike it. The ALJ denied that motion and Enbridge, ha or, excuse me, uh, Bay Mills has now appealed that decision in an application for leave to the commission so the commission would have to respond to that uh, before considering Enbridge's uh, risk analysis or uh, as part of the record. So the first thing that will happen is a decision on uh, Bay Mills application on the denial of the motion to strike and then depending on what that uh, decision is then the commission will um, consider it and typically well at least last time around it took them about five or six months from the time the briefs were submitted till the time they issued um, a decision and so it's impossible to uh, predict when the PSC will have a decision, but my guess would be sometime this year. I think the PSC has two options in rendering a decision. One is to receive a proposal for decision from the administrative law judge, and then they review, allow the parties to file exceptions. They review the PFD, the exceptions, and render a decision. The second option is they can forego issuance of a PFD by the ALJ um, if the commissioners indicate that they will read the entire record themselves, that is the transcripts themselves, and then issue a decision on their own. Do you know which of those two options the PSC is likely to take here? Yes, and they are. They have taken the position that once the record is is closed, that it is forwarded to the PSC to okay. review de novo. And so we're not we're not waiting for a PFD from no. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, the July of twenty two decision showed that the commission had already okay. sifted through many most of the documentation to decide what more it needed. And just so I summarize this in my m mind correctly. The record is closed subject to the motion for reconsideration mm -hmm. uh, and once there's a ruling on that motion for reconsideration, uh, motion for leave to appeal, I'm sorry, uh, and once there's a ruling on that motion for leave to appeal, uh, assuming it's denied, if it is denied, the record will in fact be cl closed um, and then there will be a decision. Yes, absent the commission saying we need more information on a particular issue. Okay, which it has jerk discretion Already done to do. once. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. And if, just so I know, if the motion for leave to appeal is granted, what happens then? Well, I think it's just the tribe has moved to strike a portion strike. of, so conceivably that additional testimony would simply be stricken. Okay. The record would still gotcha. be closed yep. um, unless the commission decides they want to go back as a result of that being stricken to somehow evaluate something else. But I, my guess is that wouldn't be likely. Okay, got it. Thank you. And feel free to correct me if my guess was wrong when you, when you get back up. <laughs> All right, uh, now <laughs> we are on item uh, number four, project life cycle risks and mitigations. Good morning, Chairman Novak, member Doctroff, member Webb. My name is Mike Mooney, uh, tunnel consultant to the authority. And before I talk about specifically the life cycle project risks, maybe a brief comment about risk. 
call it a public service announcement of sorts uh, because it conjures up some, some feelings. But, but essentially, discussing risk is, is a good thing. It's not an indication of a negative or red flags in things. Risk assessment, risk management are an integral part of all underground construction projects. Um, and in fact, all infrastructure construction projects. And that's very typical. And it is the case for the Great Lakes Tunnel Project as well. So the risk assessment, risk management process involves, first of all, identifying what risks exist. And these are termed in, in consequences and the probability of an event occurring. And then, of course, the consequence in that. Secondly, it's to compare those potential risks with uh, um, acceptable levels of risk and unacceptable levels. And those that are above acceptable in the unacceptable range, mitigation efforts or treatments are, are prescribed to reduce those risks to acceptable levels. Now that all sounds very technical, but we do this as individuals in our personal lives. When we mitigate risks today, we all took risk. We may do this subconsciously, consciously. We do this with our kids. And so it's all kind of part of, of, of the natural uh, world we live in. So specifically to the GLTP, um, from planning phase on the project ever since the end of feasibility through the design, which is now near 100%, well, it's 100% complete, and now in this to where we are now, where the project is now in, in selection of Enbridge's selection of a contractor, uh, there has been uh, a risk, a formal risk management approach undertaken by them, by their designers, by their owner's engineer on that. And I, I'll just give one good example of a risk uh, mitigation measure, and that is the procurement approach, which was the CMGC, Construction Manager General Contractor approach. Very early on, that was selected so that you could have contract early contractor involvement in the full design process. This is a complex tunnel project. Constructability aspects of this are critical in designing this project. And so as opposed to maybe a more classical design bid build type project where you don't have constructability aspects at the table during design, this project didn't choose that. This was a CMGC uh, type approach, which is a risk mitigation um, approach to, to driving down risk during the design phase that what may ultimately reveal themselves in the construction phase. Um, Another can, example. Can, can I interrupt for a second? When you're talking about risk as a concept th to be addressed in different contracting methods, are you talking specifically about the risks associated with operation of the tunnel upon its completion and how those might be addressed as the construction process proceeds or are you talking in a broader sense about contract risks associated with cost overruns and other unforeseen issues that may develop in the construction process itself or both? Both, absolutely okay. both. In fact, it's, you know, the, the risks can really be design phase risks, they can be construction phase risks, or they can be after construction and ownership transfer, and then they become operational risks that risks to operation and maintenance of the tunnel. So okay. to answer your question, both. Um, so when it comes to risks and risk mitigation, risks to the authority and the state of Michigan, of course, the tunnel agreement is, is a very good risk mitigation tool good example there is the indemnification of the authority um, against costs and, and claims, et cetera. And so we may get into some of those in, in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the request, remember Dr. Off requested that we address the risks to the authority um, in this project and how those risks are being um, 
mitigated, how they have been mitigated and will be continue to be mitigated throughout the, the uh, uh, procurement on Enbridge's behalf of a contractor and throughout construction, et cetera. So we have, this is an update on that. We are, and when I say we, myself, Ray, Ryan, are capturing uh, and conveying all risks as we speak over the next couple months prior to the next meeting, um, capturing and conveying how all risks or perceived risks to the authority and state of Michigan uh, have been mitigated. And so before the next meeting, we'll be able to deliver on that uh, to provide a, a summary document that conveys those risks. Um, we talked about categorizing those risks into design, into construction, into operations and maintenance. Some of the categories that those risks may stem or fall into may stem from ambiguity in the tunnel agreement uh, to delays in the construction project uh, to things like construction defects. Um, any construction project you want to look at, how does construction defect uh, impact um, the ultimate owner, which is the MSCA. Uh, and things like termination before completion of the project. The tunnel agreement's quite clear, and perhaps I'm stepping on Ray's toes here. He's the legal counsel, but the tunnel agreement's quite clear about uh, many respects or aspects uh, upon completion of the tunnel and ownership transfer uh, and during construction as the tunnel proceeds in a standard fashion. Um, but in cases of termination of the project, for example, before completion, there's some, some gray areas. Um, and so, I mean, we can certainly give some examples or discuss any of those, but perhaps it's a good stopping point to take questions. Um, I, I have a question. Um, and from my understanding in looking at the existing contract with Enbridge under section 7.5B, they will have an obligation in selecting and entering into a final contract with the construction contractor that uh, will include a statement that the authority and the state are, sub are not subject to any financial risks or liabilities as part of uh, their contractual obligation as to what they have to present at that point. Um, from your perspective, how are we as authority members with your assistance to review that statement. I'm assuming it's going to be, well, they have to provide that statement as part of uh, their entry of the construction contract. Um, how are we to evaluate that statement? And then as part of a supplemental memo uh, that you've been assigned to generate, um, what review do you envision the authority providing over that statement and, and what are the consequences if we disagree with it? Yeah, maybe I can go first because yeah. it's really a part technical and, and maybe bigger part legal question. Um, so in the RFP review process, which we are, per the agreement, entitled to participate in, I, I confirmed and I wrote this in my memo back in 2021 that the con there is a clause in the draft uh, project agreements between the Enbridge and the contractor they select that states that the contractor holds the MSCA in the state of Michigan harmless. Uh, so that, that statement does follow through to the contractor. And I'll point out from a technical perspective, that's quite important in that 
a unique aspect of tunnel projects is differing site conditions claims where the ground conditions are different as advertised and perhaps cause contractors delays and extra cost etc and that often on tunnel projects triggers claims uh, by the contractor against the the owner of the project in this case the owner is Enbridge until uh, transfer of the tunnel um, but but uh, this is where it sort of sh shifts over into the legal domain having served as an expert witness on 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 tunnel cases um, many of these really resolve or revolve around uh, who owns the ground and and what is a differing site condition etc so uh, it's important to have that um, that clause in there to protect the authority and the state of Michigan uh, against a, a differing site condition. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike, thanks a lot. Uh, I think what you're discussing is absolutely core to uh, what we're trying to do here, which is oversee this project responsibly to again protect the interests of the state. And based on my experiencing, experience working on infrastructure projects, what we're really talking about here is a risk register, uh, which is the itemization, categorization of uh, risks, material, uh, critical, medium, low, uh, in a way that allows this body to make sure that risks have been identified and that the intellectual and um, uh, project management expertise is brought to bear to identify those risks uh, so that our list is a meaningful one and then to identify uh, to what extent uh, those risks have and have not been uh, mitigated um, and you know just in our discussion uh, today uh, there clearly are uh, risks that have to be assessed not to be overstated uh, because again, the risk might be small or infinite, infinitesimally small, or the risk might be fully mitigated. Uh, but we have risks arising out of, you know, possible imprecision, uh, I mean, imprecise language or ambiguity in the tunnel agreement. Uh, there are risks arising out of construction delay. There are conceivable risks arising, as you suggested, out of construction defects, which would be the case on any infrastructure project. Risks arising out of vibration and ground disturbance. Uh, you know, risks that are theoretically there when it comes to a potential default under the default provisions in the tunnel agreement or in the project agreement. Um, there are risks arising theoretically, again, uh, out of, uh, you know, um, termination during the operation and maintenance phase of the project. And what I'm hoping you're going to do is, without doing such an exhaustive job that, you know, we get too far into the weeds is at a high but meaningful level, again, identify what risks exist um, and identify how those risks have been or are being mitigated. And if they haven't been mitigated, identify that too. So we as a body and working in consultation with Enbridge and uh, you and Ray and um, Ryan can say what additional steps or what steps need to be taken to perform that mitigation. Does that sound, and I guess I'm asking this to all of us, like something that should be done as part of our role to oversee the project and make sure that Michigan's interests are protected um, as we go forward? That's, I guess, to everyone. Yes, absolutely. And I'll agree, and I'll say that <clears throat> Mike identified the phase-related risks, but there's also risks that are um, um, a particular interest to this body residual risks that would be sure. left to us that are outside of what's covered in the tunnel agreement potentially and to the you know to the state and that's what you requested and is really to look at how 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 are the risks to the state um, financial com you know risks and and just more generally as an infrastructure project being mitigated so yeah and by giving off that list of risks I am not suggesting that this project is improperly risky because all infrastructure projects have risks that have to be mitigated. The question is, have we identified them and are we mitigating them uh, to the point that everyone can be satisfied or 
uh, folks can be satisfied that uh, we're performing the due diligence and the thinking that is necessary uh, to make sure that you know those identified risks are being taken care of. So I guess my question to Mr. to the chairperson is, could it be a, uh, something uh, that is requested for the next meeting to have that what I'll consider high level risk register or reduced to writing and generated? Is that something that is appropriate? I I think it is um, as your characterizing it I think it would be primarily Dr. Mooney that generates that document I, I think Dr. Mooney clearly would generate it to the extent it's dealing with the construction it's dealing with uh, the, the project itself but as Ryan was suggesting there are other risks yep. uh, and Ray that are legal risks or operational risks or possibly financial or commercial risks that, that may implicate Michigan that uh, uh, Dr. Mooney might not be the uh, number one person on. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a team thing, frankly, uh, you know, to, and, and it could include us. Uh, uh, well, we can't do it because of the Open Meeting Act, but in terms of working together, but it, it could be, you know, a, a team activity. Does that sound like something that should be put on the deliverable list? Uh, yeah, I think so, and I think the first step would be simply a compilation of the tremendous amount of work that has been done in that area, both the presentations in the PSC proceedings, yes. the right. earlier work that has been done, um, got a fly, um, uh, in the various environmental permitting reviews. Um, Let's, let's start by compiling all the risk analysis that has already been done and synthesizing and, and uh, just providing a good summary of all of that analysis. Yeah. And, and then I think starting to look at it from a milestone perspective about risks that are associated as we're going forward um, in each of the different milestones. Um, and, and that'll be a start. Um, it, it's going to be a comprehensive undertaking that if we're doing our jobs correctly is going to be an iterative yeah, process it, at just about every meeting. Risk is always iterative. Yeah. It, it always changes. Uh, what I'm thinking in terms of your analysis it could be neatly slotted into, uh, you know, the document that I've at least got in my mind, which is a document that at a meaningful but high level identifies risks, and then to the extent there has been testimony or work done mm -hmm. to mitigate that risk already or that identifies what those mitigations are, that can be included in the discussion under that identified risk. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's some, I, I think that we've got a shared understanding of, you know, the idea that let's identify the risks, let's identify uh, how those risks, to, to the extent that uh, they have been, have been mitigated, and what analysis has been done regarding the mitigation, uh, so we can sleep well at night, and then which risks, you know, have not yet been mitigated, um, or if any. So, you know, this can be just like the risk analysis and iterative process, but I just think it's important for us to perform our uh, oversight role to, to get a document like that going. And I think we, I, I, I hear you agree. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ray or uh, Ryan, anything to add to the, this discussion at this point, just because I know you're part of the team? Nope, I think we understand what's been requested. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Actually, apologize, one question. Would it be appropriate um, or, or allowable for uh, understanding the prohibition of deliberation outside of a public meeting for members to participate in any way? Or would you like us to, um, I think generally what you described is a, a homework assignment that requires identification, which we've initiated, and then documentation of existing um, uh, mitigation or, or um, response. And then um, 
any gaps or, or missing items, would there need to be um, authority interaction in that process or would you prefer that we work independently? I, I Yourselves. Think, I think you can certainly inquire. Well, actually, I'll let Ray answer that. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, I was Ray. going to say, uh, with a three-person board, it's right. difficult to uh, engage anyone without a, a quorum, uh, so that uh, it, my suggestion would be to delegate a contact member of the board to uh, work with, and then that would be akin to an advisory committee of one, and then uh, at least that way, then, um, we could get direction and and see if this is uh we want to make sure that uh that uh we are carrying out and accomplishing uh what the board is looking for so that if if the if there was a vote to delegate to a person then there would be no problem uh with consulting with that person between now and the next public meeting and then um, presenting the findings or you know um, discussing it at that time because there would be no deliberations per se and there would be no quorum involved. Okay. Um, Andy, I'm sensing your volunteering to serve. In I never office. volunteered for anything. <laughs> um, no, I'm happy to do that. All right. Um, we don't need to it, vote on this, do we? Or do we? I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, it, it occurs to me that after an hour, 42 minutes straight, that for general members of the public, this may have been just an incredibly boring meeting so far. And, and to um, just take a moment, I think what, to, to the extent that there are general members of the public who've, who've come to hear the proceedings today, Dr. Mooney, can, I, I think what they care about the most is this tunnel operating and what the risks are during the term that it's in operation. Can you give a two, three minute high level overview of what you understand the risks to be during the anticipated operation of the tunnel? What duplicative uh, types of measures are in place to address that risk, whether it be an explosion or a failure or some other form of disruption that, that uh, would impact what I think everyone cares the most about, and that is some catastrophe in the straits associated with the actual leakage of, or explosion uh, and loss of uh, petroleum into the, into the lake. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll, I'll start with one brief mundane. The first thing I think of on behalf of the authority is that, that as the owner of the tunnel, um, by statute or the, uh, the agreement, it's been designed for a service life of 99 years. So the assumption is that it will successfully meet its function for 99 years. So during the, the life of that, there, this is a tunnel deep in the rock um, where there's water pressure outside of it and gaskets are designed to keep that water out and there's an allowable infiltration of seep water, um, sometimes referred as nuisance water, and a system designed to collect that. Um, I think I might have boiled it down in a prior meeting to one five gallon bucket per minute, uh, if my math is correct, for the entire four length. Uh, tunnel and so that that is captured and then uh, removed by a system that's in place so over time the risks are does that infiltration increase um, over the life of the tunnel is the is the tunnel degrading at a at a faster rate than perceived those would be risks to the authority those are mitigated by the way in the operation and maintenance plan which requires Enbridge uh, to operate and maintain the tunnel, which includes inspection, regular inspections of these aspects, and then bringing those back up to, um, to par, so to speak, so that the remaining service life is always there. 
uh, that it reaches its 99 year life. So I know that's a bit mundane, but those uh, compared to what you were asking about, but I, th I think of those things, just the regular inspection maintenance and, and paying for those, that, uh, that is borne by Enbridge and that mitigates that risk to the authority. And that's an important one. Um, if you talk to any owner of a, an operating tunnel, um, there's costs involved there that, that the authority doesn't bear. Um, regarding uh, risk of explosion you're asking about, the risks, the, the operating procedure, it's a closed off tunnel. Uh, workers are not, Enbridge has summarized all of that in the MPSC proceedings and throughout the design process. Um, so it's not like a traffic tunnel or a transit tunnel that you might think of. Uh, it's closed off to workers. So there is a maintenance vehicle that with the frequency of inspections and maintenance will travel the tunnel and, and do the work they need to do. So it is a secure space in that regard. Um, you talked earlier about, or it was discussed earlier about the MPSC proceedings during that, they've really dug into the risk of explosion, the risk of uh, what that might do to a tunnel lining. Um, I've read through those, I mean those, the, the risk of explosion as highly remote as it is, um, but still analysis has been done if that were to occur, the blast resistance of the tunnel has been shown by independent analysis in the MPSC proceedings to be um, significant compared to what a blast would be. And so from that perspective, the analysis that has been done has shown the tunnel to be safe in that situation. And then secondly, uh, an explosion can lead to a fire and so Another independent assessment has been done in the MPSC proceedings um, by experts in tunnel lining on the, the capacity of the liner to withstand a, a fire that could emanate from such an explosion or a leak and ignition. And that's been shown by independent assessment to be that the tunnel lining uh, has, has sufficient capacity to, to handle that level of fire. So. Uh, I think that's what you're asking. Those are um, highly, I mean, those are very low risks given the probability of occurrence, um, but understandably the consequence of, of, of a leakage or you know, those things from happening is, is considerable and so it should be addressed and it has been addressed in the MPSC. What risks, if any, are there that relate solely to the construction phase? that you haven't just addressed, which was mainly the operation and maintenance phase. Yeah, I was strictly just looking at op so that assuming, you know, fast forward to completion of the tunnel ownership transfer now, um, what's during operation and maintenance. So during the construction uh, phase, um, you know, any, any tunnel construction project uh, like we discussed earlier, there's a number of risks that exist. Um, I'll use the one that we described earlier, the differing site condition, and I'd kind of like to walk that one out because I think it's important to kind of trace, okay, who's, who, who bears this risk? Who owns this risk, so to speak? Um, and so if, if the ground is uh, found to be by the contractor more challenging than what was, what they bid on, what was advertised, so to speak, by in the contract documents, then there could be a claim filed, could delay the project, uh, and it could cost some money if, uh, depending on the nature of how disputes are resolved in a contract, that comes, comes to fruition. But that risk is borne by Enbridge, and so uh, that risk really doesn't, the cost risk doesn't lie with the state. Could the project be delayed? Uh, it could, but there are penalty clauses in the tunnel agreement um, to encourage that not to be the case. So, it, you know, the question is, is there really a risk, a residual risk to, um, so that's kind of a typical risk that, that I would say um, would exist during construction. Another one would be just difficulties in constructing the tunnel and if there's any kind of mechanical breakdown of equipment like the tunnel boring machine, um, and so how, is a, how has that been mitigated? That's been mitigated throughout the selection and, uh, 
prescription specifications of the tunnel, or sorry, the tunnel boring machine type, uh, the, en the enlarging of the diameter of the tunnel so that all sorts of in-place, in-tunnel um, repairs can be done from within the tunnel so that there's no impact to the waters. And then the specifications that on the tunnel boring machine, it has certain um, uh, tools and techniques such as probe drilling that, that allow for mitigating um, aspects that could come up during tunneling, right, if, if major repairs need to be done on the ground. So, so are those good examples or sure. we keep? I guess, and I don't know whether this is the gist of what the chairperson was asking. You've identified risk, you've identified mitigation of risks, uh, but to someone who's principally concerned about our water uh, and the integrity of the Great Lakes, are there any risks uh, during uh, construction or through operation maintenance that, uh, in your professional opinion, based on your experience and expertise, uh, would keep you up at night? Um, so so those, those risks have been, since the beginning of the project, front and center, because obviously the project itself shouldn't have any, any risk um, to the waters. And so the risk of um, impacting the lake bed during construction, for example, has been addressed by Enbridge and their designer and an owner's engineer. And they can speak more to that if they'd like, but, but so mitigation measures there are the depth of the tunnel staying in the rock always and then the prescription of the tunnel boring machine type this pressure balance i've talked much much about that in the past the pressure balance type tunnel boring machine um, which counterbalances the water pressure that may exist at the depth in the tunnel and that improves the the stability overall of the ground as you go through so a, a number of those measures have been included in the specifications that we jointly, uh, the authority jointly developed and accepted. Um, and those, and, and so those need to be just kind of carried through to make sure those are, you know, remain in effect. And to your point about, it's a great point, but it, it bears repeating that this risk management process starts day one and it doesn't uh, end until uh, completion of the tunnel. And in this case, you know, risk in operations continues after that. But construction risk needs to carry on through and always be um, under evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for item four that we want to discuss? All right. Um, if I may make a suggestion, we've been going almost two hours. I think a quick five minute break. Um, would would be good if we can resume at noon. Um, and this is primarily because my right hamstring is now tight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
All right, we will call the meeting back to order. Thanks for to everyone for tolerating my quick uh, <laughs> my quick break. Um, number five is our next agenda item: construction contract or selection process update. Uh, and Enbridge, this will be your opportunity, uh, Ms. Moody, to address that. Yes, I did want to make a quick um, point of clarification going back mm -hmm. to the MPSC discussions that... Um, oh, yes. So there was a question about whether uh, current motions for leave or, or any future petitions for rehearing would affect the timeline for a final order, and, and it would not. It would not delay the final order. They'd be, right. it's my understanding, included in a final order, kind of wrapped up within that. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the um, contractor update. Um, was before you just in March talking about our contractor selection process. So we still are on track, um, as I indicated in March, to uh, anticipate being able to award that contract um, by the end of this year. Um, so we've continued to meet with proponents over the last three months, uh, talking on technical aspects related to things like um, the portal and shaft um, and, and other uh, areas of interest by, the, by us and the proponents. We still are considering, I think this was a question as well, but there are three um, competitive um, qualified bids that we continue to um, consider and review right now. Um, I, you know, I think it's just important to note um, that's been brought up multiple times, but um, the role that the authority and the state plays in, in the potential or the ability to observe that process um, really is a, a partnership on this project. I think it's also important to note um, the role that you have you have played and you continue to play um, in that RFP. So just a you know, reminder on the concurrence, uh, the review that the authority took place um, when the, uh, with the, RF, the draft RFP before it was actually issued in March. So we issued the RFP back in March of, let me double, yeah, March, um, we issued the RFP in March of 2022, received our bids in November of 2022, and have been reviewing those bids um, in the meantime. So. Um, that's really where we are on the contracting front. Um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Andy, you have some? Uh, a few. Okay. Um, first, a comment. I mean, obviously, there are items six and seven on the agenda regarding the uh, IQ, AC, independent quality assurance contractor, and the commercial and transactional risk advisor. Uh, you know, assuming the RFPs are issued timely, I would expect and hope that there could be, when it comes to engagement, oversight, their participation in the process uh, on our behalf. So, uh, you know, as the contract is being formed, uh, we have those eyes on that particular prize. Fair enough? Yeah. Again, welcome your participation and okay. in, in, um, once those approvals take place on yeah. your end. Yep. Okay. Um, now. I do have some questions uh, about what Enbridge is doing right now, simply because uh, I'm not sure the monthly updates we're getting yet are particularly robust, uh, which is a subject that I think was discussed last time. Uh, and you know, I'll preface these questions by saying the more information we have, particularly in writing from Enbridge, the more uh, you know, trust the the, the deepening. Um, of that trust, I think uh, uh, th th that will occur. Uh, so by way of background, let me just ask these questions. Uh, how many people right now uh, are working on behalf of Enbridge on this project, approximately? Approximately, um, I'm gonna say somewhere between 30 to 50 people, give or take. Is it possible to break down uh, the, the, the services that those people are perform are performing into specific uh, groups of activities? And if so, what are those groups of activities? Are you talking for the entirety of the project or yeah, just, just the- Yeah, I just, oh. what are, I would, I really yeah. would like to know what Enbridge is doing during this interstitial period when we're waiting for the permits, but there's a procurement going on. What Enbridge is doing and what individual people or groups of people are doing on the project right now. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So I sit in a role that um, is uh, able to be involved in a lot of these discussions and calls from a, uh, a 
going to be broad, but happy to get more information to you. But we have a full environmental team that's looking at environmental impacts, looking at surveys um, that we can do on the front end or that kind of pre-construction activity. Uh, we have a, a robust law and regulatory group that's looking at a lot of these discussions that you're all um, talking about today when it comes to our uh, permitting proceedings, comes to our um, regulatory proceedings, um, and then looking, you know, future into the project. Um, we have our engineering team uh, that's not only, you know, Enbridge, but our kind of world-class, um, not kind of our world-class uh, engineers that we're working with on the design and construction. So um, they're working every day on a lot of that um, uh, IR requests with the Army Corps that I talked about. Um, we also have um, our tribal team that's working um, uh, with uh, tribal leaders in the area and, and kind of across our system uh, to, to look at impacts and, and relationships there. Um, we have a, a, a community engagement team that works very closely with the community that you'll hear and see today. Um, you know, not only works locally, but throughout the state, um, talking about um, listening to residents and really understanding what the concerns are um, and how we may might mitigate those and, and really also hearing about the support that there is for this type of infrastructure project. So um, I hope I'm not forgetting, oh, we have a large, obviously our, our current operations team that also is working to ensure um, the ongoing safe operations of our existing pipelines and then what that will look like, you know, in a tunnel. So if that gives you a it, it does. broad but and you know what i'm thinking is that the reports that we get should discuss those activities okay uh and give us visibility into what your teams are doing what challenges they're confronting what problems they're solving uh and um i think to get the reports that are currently being generated, notwithstanding the what I would c consider a marginal enhancement, doesn't give this panel, I think, the insight into your uh, work uh, to uh, really allow us to understand. And I think, again, with that understanding comes confidence and trust, and you know, it's all part of what I would consider a responsible oversight um, role that has to be performed by us. I would also say, just not by way of background, because it's important, uh, you know, on other infrastructure projects, uh, the reporting uh, activities and documents uh, that the, you know, the constructor or the concessionaire, or whatever term we want to use, gives to the owner uh, or stakeholders is is far more detailed than what we're getting. I mean, there are thick documents that, you know, you know, require real effort to generate that have, I think, integrity when it comes to giving that good overall view of the playing field and what the players are doing. So I would ask you once again uh, to consider and ask Enbridge to consider, you know, when you think about your reporting, think about what the activities that you guys are doing um, and, and enumerate them and explain them, not in a way that's oppressive or overly burdensome, but in a way that you think, stepping into our shoes, would give us a meaningful understanding of what Enbridge is doing and what the challenges are, how they're being addressed, and what the achievements are, as opposed to kind of like line items, check, check, check. I think that's great feedback and something we're happy to do. Um, there's certainly a lot of work and, and a lot of that uh, reporting that goes on in, in everyday uh, activity on our end, so we're happy to to look, uh, take that feedback and try to include that in our next report here. And I would also uh, make one more comment. I mean, there is a tendency, my experience suggests, that reports like this tend to be not scrubbed, and not disingenuous, but uh, presented in a way that um, is uh, maybe, uh, a, a word would be somewhat inscrutable, uh, where problems are not being addressed as candidly as possible. So I would also encourage whoever drafts it or whoever uh, you know visualizes this to you know err on the side of candor so that the report is as informative as possible and doesn't come across as quote unquote PR. Absolutely. You know no, what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand, and we're happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else on that item? No. All right. Thank you. We may, however, as we're discussing the next two items, ask for your 
input to, to come back up. Uh, we are now on item number six, the IQA contractor procurement. Ryan. Yes, I provided um, a draft RFP for procurement of a independent quality assurance contractor as contemplated in the tunnel agreement to oversee on behalf of the authority in the field the construction quality assurance um, work that will be conducted by Enbridge and its contractor. This was developed in cooperation with Dr. Mooney, um, Mr. Howd, and Rick Liptak, um, MDOT's chief construction, bridge construction engineer. And um, should you have comments or questions, I'm happy to address those, but we would request um, that you allow us to move forward with that procurement so that we can have that contractor on board to continue to support uh, the project as it moves forward. In terms of when the independent QA entity would be performing their functions, when is it that you envision it necessary for them to be retained on board, good to go? We'd actually like to have the QA, the IQA, on board in advance of selection of a contractor and, and in advance of um, actually the agenda number, what is it, seven? We'd like a bit of cooperation between those entities should you approve the procurements um, and, and we make those selections so that we um, have a full view of risk on the project and we're tuned into exactly those items that are um, most pressing with respect to quality assurance. Um, but I'll address the first item first. Functionally, uh, Chairman Nowak, we'd like to have that QA uh, con contractor on board to receive deliverables that'll be submitted by the contractor specifically related to quality. So the contractor will be required to have a quality management plan and then um, specific inspection and testing plans for each constructed element that's associated to any um, item of work included in the project specifications. We want our independent quality assurance contractor to say these are objective, enforceable, um, adequate, and, um, and then they can align their forces and work to receive the deliverables associated with those um, inspection and testing plans as they're created, as they're performed. So before the contractor, I have a start date here of October that may be aggressive, but we like to shoot for that. During the last um, session, the, the last meeting, um, you articulated the different um, funding sources for different elements of the project, uh, specifically funding sources available for, you, for the authority to conduct uh, different, different elements of, of our review. Can you briefly describe again the source of funding for performance of the independent quality assurance contractor um, and uh, how that would be expended over what period of time? Good question. It is, this is uh, the independent quality assurance contractor per the tunnel agreement is paid for by Enbridge. So we would um, issue an RFP. We would, um, obviously the scope has been drafted for you here. Um, we will be and have been estimating what we anticipate the cost to be for the term, which in this document specifies October 123 to December 31, 28, roughly. Um, there will be a bell-shaped curve of activity and, and work that takes place during that term. Um, and um, we would receive, we would then, the pr process would be that we would select based on the RFP and the proposals that we, would see, we received. We would verify the scope with um, the selected um, consultant and then we would negotiate a price 
and request that amount from Enbridge. Okay. Have have actual amounts been under discussion uh, with Enbridge as to the anticipated cost? They have not. Okay. We were asked. <laughs> Andy, do you have questions? All right. Uh, you want approval of this scope of services today? That would be great. And of course, take questions, comments. Um, and uh, yes, with your approval, I would advertise it. Okay. So the motion should be approve of what we is before us and the release publicly so that it's on the market. Yes, please. So I will move <laughs> uh, to approve the RFP as drafted and subsequent, if there is an approval, uh, to issue the RFP publicly can, uh, pursuant to normal processes. That motion phrased in a manner you're comfortable with? Does that okay. work? Yes. All right. It's been so moved. Any discussion? Nope. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The motion carries. Uh, the next agenda item is commercial and transition transaction risk advisor procurement. Ryan, you're still up. Yes. So this procurement, as requested by Member Doctoroff, um, to support um, a review of the construction contract um, as one item of work, but also more generally, I think the um, um, the risk of the project and specifically the commercial risk potentially to the state of the project um, either th uh, as a result of that contract or otherwise um, it's a it's a bit of a specialty service um, in fact it's not a bit of, it is a specialty service commercial advisory work um, for the state of Michigan um, and I have a statewide contract for these services uh, with a firm called KPMG. Um, in the past when these services have been needed, um, we um, draft a scope of work and issue it to the firm KPMG. In this case, they would then also uh, advertise for the services of a transaction advisor. You may know that, in fact, I, I would guess that both of you know, and actually Member Webb also knows, that in the state of Michigan to um, provide advice on Michigan law, you have to be the Attorney General, the Department of Attorney General. And if you don't work directly for the Department of Attorney General, you are hired as a state, a special assistant Attorney General, as in, in the case of um, Ray Howd. This service would not be legal advice, it would be commercial and transaction advice. These are very specialized services specialized skill sets that we would procure through the KPMG contract. That's just background to say this is not a typical MDOT procurement because it's not for pre-qualified service or typical consultant services, it's for commercial advisory services. So that's the scope that's before you. Similarly, I'd like to, through KPMG, uh, engage um, to hire them to perform that work. Keeping in mind the statement you just made or the observation you made about the necessity of any legal consultation being provided by uh, an assistant uh, AG or a special assistant, to the extent that the role that is envisioned in this scope of services would require legal advice that goes beyond what Ray might feel comfortable providing in, in terms of this broader uh, transactional context, uh, do you envision that KPMG may enlist um, a lawyer or law firm that would supplement its role uh, to provide those legal consultation services and in that context also receive uh, the, the blessing, so to speak, of the AG's office under the Frank Kelly rule, which is any assistant 
that provides legal consultation on behalf of the state he has to be an assistant AG that's exactly what they'll do they'll hire a law firm that will that will provide transaction advisory services okay. not legal advice so um, they would make recommendations if it's related to Michigan law that would be a um, that would be analyzed by Ray or other or Ray's colleagues at the AG okay um, did you have other questions nope all right. Uh, I have only one, and this is to expand uh, to some extent the services to be provided. I'd like to include an additional bullet point uh, that would state review and advise on Enbridge financial and shareholder reports concerning the project. Actually, I'd say financial shareholder and regulatory reports concerning the project. And let me expand on this a little for, for Enbridge's and the public's um, benefit. Um, one of the commercial risks associated with the project that I think has changed considerably between 2018 and today is the anticipated duration of Enbridge's operation of uh, the actual conveyance of petroleum products through the, the tunnel. It's been discussed, I think, in some of the past meetings, for example, that in Enbridge's FERC submissions, uh, and, and this was identified, I think, by Sean McBrarity, so I, I haven't heard either confirmation or non-confirmation of, of this suggestion by Mr. McBrarity from an Enbridge official. But one of the things that he indicated in a past meeting was that in one of the FERC proceedings, uh, there was a significant shortening of the anticipated depreciation for rate-making purposes of the anticipated life of the tunnel's operation. And when I say the tunnel's operation, I mean use of the tunnel for conveyance of petroleum product. Um, it seems to me over time that Enbridge's view as to how long a period of time it will be operating and using the tunnel for, for conveyance of petroleum products may be different today than it was in 2018, may be different in 2026 if that is the anticipated conclusion point of the Army Corps ZIS than it is today. Um, because as we all know, the regulatory developments about the use of fossil fuels is, is changing and potentially changing rapidly. Um, that is one of the elements that I'd, I'd like to hear from Enbridge on as those developments occur, uh, and also to have some idea from an independent uh, evaluator of, of the transaction and the, the, the project as to what impact uh, a shortening of the duration for the anticipated use of this tunnel for petroleum products, uh, what, what impact that may have on, on the project as a whole. And, and I included the shareholder and regulatory um, <laughs> reports and statements that Enbridge makes because they are the most transparent source of information we have from the company as to what they're envisioning. Would you repeat that additional bullet point just so I've got it for the motion? Yeah. Uh, it is review and advise on Enbridge financial shareholder and regulatory reports concerning the project. Uh, 
and, and regulatory is a pretty broad term, but specifically the ones I'm thinking are the FERC reports because they're the ones that'll have the juiciest information in terms of the, the financial projections about depreciation, rate making, et cetera, that, that I think would be the most material. Would you like me to make a motion? Sure. Okay. So I will move uh, to issue, approve the RFP as written regarding the commercial and transactional risk advisor and issue it uh, subject to uh, uh, your amendment uh, to include that. And that amendment is a bullet point uh, at the end of the scope of service part. Review and advise on Enbridge's financial uh, shareholder. shareholder and regulatory reports concerning the project. Yes. Couldn't read my writing. <laughs> okay. So. So uh, all in favor of the amendment, aye. Aye. Um, and before we actually vote on the motion, uh, just one other thing. Can we have an articulation of the source of funding okay, sure. for, for this? I think we discussed it last time, but I wanted to, clarif to, to clarify it just for the record. Um, I don't think this is one where you guys are footing the bill. <laughs> That's correct. This is straight protection fund funding for an independent analysis um, from okay. independent sources, yep. Okay. And the current projected amount of available funds for this is approximately what? Approximately $4 million, but okay. just less. All right. Um, ready to vote on the motion? Sure am. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the next agenda item, we've, we've completed the new business. Um, before we get to public comments, I wanted to make one quick point, and that is that the minutes from the last meeting included, I think for the first time since I've seen minutes for the authorities business, an outline of the different sources of funding that are available to the authority and the amounts available for that, that had been dedicated to particular contracts and how much remained available under each of them. I would like that to be a running um, agenda item just to provide a status as to you know the amount that's been expended uh what it has been expended on as to each of the different contracts that the authority has in progress and what the available remaining amounts of appropriated funds are all right now uh we are at agenda item six public comment um, do we have a sign-up sheet of how many people have signed up? We do. We have 11 people who signed up, and I will uh, call their names. We, you also received eight comments online, so I'll pass those up now. Okay. And for the comments that have been provided in writing, um, if we can make sure, similar to the comments that are provided, um, verbally today that each of these are included in the um, in the minutes of the meeting with the identification of the commenter and if they identify a specific uh, affiliation that that also be included in the minutes all right we did receive some written comments during the meeting today and I'll add those to the ones previously submitted and uh, get you a final packet later today. Uh, I'll start by calling up your names in the order you signed up. You have three minutes uh, to provide your comments and if you could state your name and if you represent yourself, a business or an organization. Uh, first we have Patty followed by David Holtz.
Good afternoon and welcome to the beautiful Straits of Mackinac. We're glad that you came up today. Uh, my name is Patty Peak, and I'm a full-time resident of St. Ignace. Um, I'm representing myself in my comments today, although I do belong to a number of other groups, but today I'm me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some questions and areas of concern as you consider the mechanics and costs of the potential tunnel. As you deliberate, I urge you to factor in the cost to those of us who live, work, and recreate here, those of us who are literally at ground zero. My husband and I own the home situated closest to the northern end of the proposed tunnel. As you can well imagine, the advent of many years of excavation and construction along Boulevard Drive will significantly impact the local area and most definitely affect the quality of life of us and potentially the value of our homes. My specific concerns today um, include a number of areas of question and perhaps this leads into some of the areas you were talking about um, looking at in terms of risks. Um, first, what may be the effect of drilling the exit tunnel on local wells? Specifically, Enbridge indicates it will create an uh, exit portal 70 feet in diameter and 100 feet deep. What's the potential for disruption of the groundwater and or intrusion or frack out into the underlying aquifer? What assessment of the likelihood of breach of the aquifer will be done? Will there be oversight or monitoring done of neighboring wells, such as mine? What, if any, accommodation is planned if our wells are breached or impacted? Secondly, what is the expected effect on the lake water quality? The permitting application initially for the Corps was woefully short of detail, especially in terms of wastewater treatment and precautions. What specific treatment system is going to be used to process the massive amount of uh, wastewater produced during the tunneling activity and the excavation, including bentonite slurry? Where will the treatment facility and containment ponds be located? How are fluctuating lake levels going to impact the potential for contamination of groundwater and wetlands? What level of turbidity of the water will occur? In addition, there has been no mention anywhere in the permits about monitoring the canal that runs from the Enbridge property on the west side into Lake Michigan near the ATC transmission facility. Third, what will be the real extent of disruption of the wetlands that run across the entire area? Although Enbridge estimates the damage will be minimal, about one mile of roadbed will be raised and widened to accommodate heavy machinery and traffic. Currently, it's a dirt road. In addition, the excavation area surrounding the tunnel exit is subject to water intrusion during rains and spring thaw. We also have concerns about the fact that this is a very culturally sensitive site where indigenous peoples have done their summer encampments for years and years and years. Um, there is a potential for disturbing and, and discovering significant artifacts. And I just ask today, before you leave the community, take a few minutes, drive the boulevard, it's beautiful, go from one end to the other. You'll have almost a mile and a half of unencumbered views of the Mackinac Bridge, of the pristine waters, that gorgeous little shoreline. Um, listen to the birds, smell the air, although we have a little smoke from those fires downstate, but uh, take a little time to see what it looks like to be a visitor to our pure Michigan, because it's gorgeous. Thank you so much for your consideration. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Um, two quick observations. One, I noticed you were reading from written materials. Yes. If, if you feel comfortable, please um, submit them to us because it would be helpful to have I, them. I have. You have okay. a copy of these, and I also had submitted an online comment. And then the I'm an old professor of nursing, so I, <laughs> I tend to be a little overzealous when it and, comes to and, handiwork. And then the second is just a personal observation when you said smell the air. It's the first thing I noticed when I got out of the car is how gorgeous the air smells up here. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, enjoy your day. Thanks. Thanks. I'd like to make a personal suggestion. Uh, you know, we, I received uh, from Liz Kirkwood, uh, I think, uh, Flow Water, uh, some uh, questions uh, about the project and then raising concerns similar to the questions that we just got. I think it's really important uh, to make sure that questions like that are 
synthesized, chronicled, uh, and that we understand what the responses to those questions are. Um, so Mike, my, my personal uh, opinion at least is, you know, let's make sure that we're keeping them, you know, in an organized way so we know what the responses to those questions and concerns are uh, and whether uh, we're comfortable with those responses. Is that okay? Okay. David is next, followed by Leonard Page. Hello, um, I'm David Holtz. Uh, I reside in Gross Point Woods. Um, I'm speaking for, uh, I mean, all the comments I'm making today are on behalf of myself and, and not any other entity, including um, Oil and Water No Mix or uh, Sierra Club, where I'm a member of the Michigan Chapter Executive Committee and the National Board of Directors. Um, my comments are really kind of focused on a lot of the dis what's been discussed today. I prepared them in advance, but uh, it really aligns pretty well with a lot of the conversations today. Um, as you know, exercising independent oversight uh, of this massive project, which is potentially dangerous, requires eyes and ears that see and hear more, I would submit, than you're being, you have heard today or have heard from to date uh, in these meetings. Uh, in a Harvard Law Review article in April 2022, uh, the Michigan Public Service Commission was held up as one example of a three-member public agency who exercised independence in decision-making and oversight on the Line 5 tunnel. Uh, Enbridge filed a motion, for example, uh, with the MPSC in the proceedings that you heard about today uh, to exclude evidence of the tunnel's adverse impact on climate change. That's what Enbridge wanted. No evidence of the tunnel's impact on climate change. The staff and administrative law judge agreed with Enbridge. Uh, they sided with Enbridge. Their experts sided with Enbridge. But the three commissioners did their homework and heard from other experts, uh, experts from the Bay Mills Indian community, for example, and others, and independently concluded that Michigan environmental law gave them a mandate to assess climate pollution. That is what I'm asking you to do going forward, to not just hear from the people who are on like today's agenda, Emridge and others, but at every step, at every opportunity, on every important issue, to hear from and consider other views, including from engineering and other experts who may even have more actual experience with large underwater tunnel projects or come from outside the oil industry. In an article written by Commissioner Doctoroff in the Wayne State Law Review, I recommend it to everyone, <laughs> uh, about infrastructure oversight, the legendary late Michigan Senator Carl Levin is quoted and cited by Commissioner Doctoroff on how oversight should be exercised. Uh, Senator Levin, the longtime chair of the Permanent Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, encouraged hearing from different points of view and to dig deeply into issues and challenge assumptions. You will not get a, you will get a better result, Senator Levin said. I can't think of better advice from a better source on how the Mackinac Straits Court Authority should approach its oversight responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Leonard Page. I'm an retired attorney from Sheboygan, Michigan. I'm also vice chair of the Straits of Mackinac Alliance, which is primarily a group of uh, landowners in the Straits area. And uh, we've been very active for some years in the uh, Line 5 issue. We, we had today really a course on risk management. And uh, uh, I don't claim to be a uh, an expert in that area, but I do know after looking at these issues for several years that risk is a result of probability times the potential for damages. Um, given uh, the potential for damages to the Great Lakes, no matter how low the probability of a disaster, an oil pipeline in the Great Lakes is a high risk venture. We heard a lot of discussions about mitigating 
about addressing the risk. Those are very subjective words. Uh, mitigating is lessening the severity. Uh, addressing, w w my, I guess my point is, is there an acceptable level of risk to the Great Lakes in the, the construction of a tunnel and the operation of an oil pipeline within an enclosed space? We heard a lot of discussion about the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission addressing the explosion issue. I, I am still taken aback by Gary Street's paper of April 8th, 2022, in which he noted a one-eighth inch diameter hole in the tunnel uh, releasing um, explosive gas for 19 minutes creates a 345 pounds of TNT uh, possible explosion. Now I've also heard that the uh, uh, risk of an ignition is uh, negligible or almost non-existent. Again, I'm told that most chemical engineers assumes the existence of the possibility for ignition. You have fuel and you have air in an enclosed space. Um, I, I just don't see that this is an acceptable risk uh, for the state of Michigan. And I strongly urge you to look independently and more closely at whether or not we need an oil pipeline to be operating in the Straits of Mackinac. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jody Kaiser, followed by John McCahan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you all for stepping into this tough and thankless role of providing oversight to critical infrastructure project. Um, I'm very pleased with the questions and discussions I've heard today, and they mirror some of my questions. Um, on behalf of the Mackinac County Board of Commissioners, in alignment with our resolution in support of Line 5 Tunnel, passed unanimously in September of 2019, uh, we would like to express unwavering support for the Straits Utility Corridor Tunnel Design and emphasize the urgent need to begin this crucial project. The proposed tunnel design promises to address numerous infrastructure challenges and environmental concerns and provide much needed benefits to our community and the region as a whole. However, as previously stated here, the previous board of M, uh, you guys uh, voting to not file jointly for the permits under 4.2 of the tunnel agreement may have delayed the permits or at least not helped facilitate adequate pressure on Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we would like to encourage you as a board to do everything possible to facilitate and accelerate the approval and anywhere you can act. And I was very pleased with um, the questions. Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to hear today, so I'm very, I'm very confident in your guys' ability to provide oversight and move this forward project forward at the best of your ability. Um, uh, first and foremost, the Straits Chility Corridor Tunnel was a compromise to significantly alleviate concerns of an accidental discharge into the Great Lakes. It will enhance reliability and security of our utility networks and energy needs by establishing a dedicated underground corridor, it will protect vital infrastructure and reduce the risk of potential damage caused by external factors such as severe weather events, accidental disruptions, and or sabotage. Furthermore, the tunnel design exhibits a remarkable commitment to environmental stewardship. And I think a, a lot of, I studied um, the presentation from the last meeting quite thoroughly the other, over the weekend, and um, I like what I see. I'm kind of an engineering geek, so. Um, furthermore, uh, by keeping the tunnel in solid bedrock, they've minimized disturbance to the lake bed ecosystem and mitigates some pot potential for discharge, however minute that risk might be. Um, in addition to safeguarding infrastructure and environment, the Straits Utility Corridor Tunnel will provide significant economic advantages, um, and you're all aware of all that, attracting new investments and facilitating economic growth and ensuring a reliable and efficient flow of utilities and energy to businesses, residents, and industries of the Upper Peninsula, and it's greatly needed. Um, we firmly believe that the timely commencement of this project is of paramount importance and our community continues to grow and evolve. The strain on our existing utility, electric, and propane needs become increasingly evident. 
By taking prompt action, we can proactively address these challenges and ensure a sustainable and prosperous future for our region. In conclusion, I would like to urge you to give full consideration to the benefits presented by this design and to expedite the build portion of this project. The tunnel's ability to enhance infrastructure reliability, protect the environment, and foster economic growth makes it an invaluable asset for our community and surrounding region. Thank you for uh, your attention. I trust that you'll carefully consider it, uh, the support for this tunnel, and um, respect the amount of capital and engineering genius to put this project together and its immense potential to meet our community's pressing needs and alleviate the environmental concerns. Every delay significantly increases the cost of the project and prolongs the unnecessary risks some say the current pipeline poses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a reminder, if you uh, care to submit the, your comments in, in written form, um, just so we have them, that would be helpful. Uh, next is John, followed by Katie Olson. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John McCahan and uh, I'm from Boyne City, Michigan. Uh, I retired to Michigan about 20, 25 years ago and have enjoyed the uh, waters with lots of boating on the Great Lakes. And uh, uh, prior uh, to uh, my retirement, I worked for 30 to 35 years for a company located initially in Washington, D.C. Uh, that was involved with reliability engineering for N NASA projects and for the Department of Defense aviation projects. So I have a little bit of a feeling for what reliability engineering is. And uh, it's good that all the risk analysis has been done, but the bottom line is the probabilities are not zero. On, the, on a catastrophic event, you know. And as, as much engineering has, uh, has gone in to the NASA projects, we can see there that the probabilities were not zero. You can have catastrophic failures. And so I urge you to please consider that, that if a catastrophic failure occurs, and the probability is not zero of that happening, we will have a, a, an extreme disaster in the Great Lakes. Thank you very much. Next is Katie, followed by Ryan Stern. Hi, I'm Katie Olson, and I live in Rapid River on the shores of beautiful Lake Michigan. Um, there are a whole lot of reasons why Line 5 needs to shut down now, any one of which is enough to require it shut down. Um, to start with, we are in breach of our treaties with indigenous peoples. Uh, for example, we're trespassing on Chippewa Reservation. Um, we need to honor our promises to indigenous people. We've treated them disrespectfully, to put it mildly, far too long. Um, no project like this has ever been undertaken, so I think the assessments about it are pretty meaningless. Um, and then, of course, regarding climate change, uh, we know that we need to reduce carbon, to carbon emissions 50% by 2030, six and a half years away. Obviously, new, infra new fossil fuel infrastructure of any type is going to increase carbon emissions. Um, so, <clears throat> and of course, that doesn't even take into consideration the, the dangers that Line 5 poses. Uh, University of Michigan scientists call the Straits the worst possible place for an oil spill in the Great Lakes. Now that's saying something because the spill anywhere in the Great Lakes would be disastrous. Um, but this is a particularly ecologically sensitive area. Um, it is it comprises 21% of the world's fresh water supply. Um, the tourism and fishing and shipping industries are obviously vital to Michigan and the other Great Lakes states. Uh, and it's, you know, Leonard was talking about, do we need this pipeline? 
No, we don't, because this is only a shortcut for Enbridge. There's absolutely no need for this pipeline to go through Michigan, let alone the Great State, the Great Lakes. Um, it's just a shortcut to get their oil from one part of Canada to another, and about 5% of it goes to Michigan. <clears throat> Line 5 has already leaked 33 times, including the disastrous Kalamazoo River leak. What was that, 10, 15 years ago? Um, it has leaked out 1.1 million gallons of oil. Uh, Enbridge has a less than stellar, to put it mildly, safety record, and uh, frankly cannot be trusted. They have already been operating outside of the contract with Michigan for years. Um, their interest is in profits, not in our safety or in protecting the Great Lakes. And you know, I've heard through this whole day a lot of talk about mitigating risks, um, protecting and representing stakeholders, uh, minimal environmental impact, acceptable levels of risk, uh, risks borne by Enbridge, infinitesimally small risks. First of all, the risks are not borne by Enbridge. They're borne by us. They're borne by literally all of humanity. Again, 21% of the world's fresh water supply is in our Great Lakes. We are morally obligated to deny this, these permits and deny Enbridge this shortcut. Um, and again, back to what Leonard was saying, he talked about um, assessing risk and it being a product of the likelihood of something happening and looking at what's happening. And if probability is anything more than zero in this, it's too great. We are risking, the, the risk we're taking is catastrophic to all of mankind. Any degree of risk is too high. Um, mankind has lived for a long time without fossil fuels, but we've never lived without water. The pipeline puts Enbridge's short-term desires ahead of our children and grandchildren's future. Protecting the Great Lakes must take precedence over all else. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ryan, and after Ryan is Cam Cavett. Hi, my name is Ryan Stern from Marquette, Michigan, on the shores of Lake Superior. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to the UP to hear the local perspective on the Line 5 tunnel. All forms of energy are needed for our local and, na and national security and our economies to move forward and to secure our, en secure our energy needs for the future. The tunnel is the most common sense solution to ensure that safe, reliable delivery while also protecting the Great Lakes. The tunnel will be built to the highest standards by the men and women of the Michigan Building and Construction Trades. The Michigan Building Trades stands in support of this project and are ready to start the construction of this monumental project. All of the men and women of the building trades are ready and trained to build this to the safest standards possible. Thank you. Thanks. Next is Cam, followed by Mike Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cameron Cabot. I'm a state representative from the 106th House District, which includes six counties in northeast Michigan, uh, two here in the Straits, Sheboygan and Presque Isle County. Just want to say I'm grateful for the opportunity to address the members of the Mackinac Straits Corridor today. Thank you for traveling all the way up to the Straits and for your um, valuable insight and oversight on this once in a generation opportunity in building the Great Lakes Tunnel. As a state representative whose tunnel would greatly affect my district, um, I want to express my deep appreciation for your commitment and support. The Great Lakes Tunnel is not only critical importance to our local communities, but also holds the potential for massive economic benefits across northern Michigan. By improving the infrastructure of the Straits of Mackinac, we're opening doors to new opportunities, attracting investments, and stimulating growth throughout the region. The Great Lakes Tunnel will have a great impact on our economy, creating jobs while helping preserve our natural resources. I wholeheartedly endorse and approve of the initiatives undertaken by the Th Corridor Authority, which has the potential to shape the future for generations to come. 
your dedication and service in overseeing this project will undoubtedly contribute to the prosperity and well-being of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Mike, followed by Katie Bargland, and then Sean McBrady. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Smith. I'm the executive director of the Upper Peninsula Construction Council, which is a labor management nonprofit working with signatory contractors across the UP and the union building trades. Thank you for coming to St. Ignis. Um, we do hope you will stay for a while, maybe have some lunch and check out the local flair. Um, so we stand in full support of the Great Lakes Tunnel project. Um, we're ready to get to work and Enbridge is ready to invest. It's time to move the Great Lakes Tunnel Project forward. Um, this project will provide next generation infrastructure for serving the utility needs of residents and businesses in both the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula and throughout the Great Lakes region. Many of us use tunnels every day. We have the technological capability, environmental experts, and safety experts necessary to build the Great Lakes Tunnel to protect the environment and the communities. This is the right plan for the environment and Michigan. The Great Lakes Tunnel can help ensure extra layers of safety and environmental protection in our waterways without compromising the delivery of energy on which Michigan depends. There is a reason more than 70% of Michigan's support of the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. It will provide additional connectivity between the peninsulas safeguarding importing, important utilities while protecting the waterways of millions, millions of us treasure and still give us much needed affordable, reliable energy. If we are looking at what's best for our communities and for the environment, the Great Lakes Tunnel is the answer now and is now being, and being built to house additional utilities in the future. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Katie Bargland. I'm the market share representative for the Laborers Union in Michigan. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about Michigan Laborers and why we're in full support of building the Great Lakes Tunnel. Um, our union, um, first of all, we represent about 14,000 tradesmen and women across Michigan. And we operate four training facilities across Michigan that are state of the art. Um, we pride ourselves on being one of the safest, most productive workforces in Michigan, and we're offering some of the best benefits in the industry. Together with our contractor partners, independently operate, we're independently operating our healthcare and pension funds without any government help. Our healthcare fund provides over $50 million in benefits annually to our members, and our pension adds over $75 million to our state's economy. When it comes to energy, our union takes an all of the above approach to updating energy infrastructure. Um, this means our, you can find our members working solar, wind, nuclear, coal, and transportation systems like pipelines. In Michigan, our members do several million hours of pipeline and underground work each year, and we take the utmost pride in ensuring our projects provide safe, reliable energy for our state. So to answer the question why Line 5 Tunnel is such an important project for us is pretty simple. Line 5 keeps energy flowing in our, in our state and we rely on this energy. The plan addresses environmental concerns that many have raised and just as important, the tunnel keeps Michigan laborers on the job and creates new opportunities for us during the construction and operation of the tunnel. In conclusion, it's time to make the already safe pipeline and make it even safer by building the Great Lakes Tunnel and the Michigan laborers are ready to get to work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, authority members, thank you for coming up today. Um, I'm Sean McBrady, and I'm here representing Oil and Water Don't Mix, as well as Clean Water Action. Um, and I wanted to begin just by uh, commending your discussion here at the beginning of the meeting about the correct role of oversight and how the authority um, should govern themselves by bylaws and procedures to make sure that whatever you do is you know not only legally defensible but good for the public's interest 
Um, it was really great to hear that from that authority, and I do hope that the memo uh, detailing your proposed roles and responsibilities, oversight, et cetera, will be made public uh, so that the public and also lawyers who are also acquainted, uh, you know, acquainted with both Public Act 395 as well as the other, uh, as well as the other documents governing the Straits Corridor Authority uh, might be able to share their opinions after reading um, what has been presented to you. Um, so today, I know I heard a lot about uh, what, what sort of the role of Straits Corridor Authority is um, along those lines. And the, uh, as far as the Army Corps process goes, um, in your oversight role, I think it was a great suggestion for the Straits Corridor Authority to be meeting with and consulting with Army Corps on a more consistent basis. And there are things I think that both sides, Army Corps and the Corridor Authority can gain from working closer together. Uh, for instance, I don't believe anything about having fiber optic cables in the tunnel is in the Army Corps uh, record so far, and that would be something good for them to know as they're moving forward. Uh, and on the other hand, the piece that um, I know was mentioned about the, um, uh, the FERC filing the 2020 FERC depreciation report. I know Army Corps is looking into that and EPA is looking into that as well. And so there's things that y'all could mutually benefit from knowing about what the other is working on on this project, which we know is extraordinarily complicated. Um, again, uh, you know, something I've said before, I know I'd, it would be really great for the authority to much like the Public Service Commission is doing hear from other parties uh, that are not Enbridge or contractors working on this project. Um, now, I know I, I don't want to claim any intent or put words in anybody's mouth, but I know during um, presentations today, it seemed to be inferred that um, the uh, Enbridge analysis in the Public Service Commission case of the risk of explosion in the tunnel, for instance, was pretty solid, and we don't know that yet. The Public Service Commission hasn't taken an opinion, and Bay Mills has presented experts with uh, you know, the same qualifications as Enbridge's experts, um, or even as your own experts, uh, who have contradicted that opinion. Um, so thank you for coming up today, and I just wanted to encourage you to keep kind of working out your oversight role in this process, and uh, encouraging or uh, encourage you to make sure that other entities outside of the actual project are included. And then just one more thing, as far as the uh, FERC filing, I did uh, send in an email the EPA comments to Army Corps, which uh, detail and discuss the FERC filing and their first comment in there, and then it links directly to the FERC filing itself. Awesome. Yes. I can forward that again. I just checked my email on it. Thank you. That concludes the public comment. Were there any members of the public who did not sign up that wanted to provide comment? Okay, I, I don't have much to say, but. Uh, if you can uh, start with your, your name. Yeah, my name is Mark Palms from state of Michigan. Uh, I've got a lot of family history here in the state of Michigan and uh, I guess I, I just spent the morning fishing out on the lakes. Uh, I'm an educator, retired. I spend my winters in Louisiana, which uh, I truly adore the culture, and I, I in, enjoy Louisiana very much. But in, in the past few decades, I've noticed great consequences to Army Corps of Engineers designed levees that failed. Also, uh, just the fact that We've, we've done so much petroleum production in Louisiana. The effects of that are showing up in many ways. Insurance companies are leaving the state of uh, Louisiana, so rates are skyrocketed for homeowners. This is just a result of the weather change, the climate change. Clearly, it's a struggle for Louisiana to not rely on petroleum production because it's jobs, jobs, jobs. Except the coastline is disappearing, the lifestyles are changing, and the jobs are now being created to reduce disaster relief. 
Now, is this the kind of society that we are creating that we have to recover, and those are the jobs that we have, when what's really lost is the environment that's buried beneath? And I think that this is something we have to be really careful of because we have such great fresh water in the state of Michigan. We don't want to have to someday rebuild what's already here. And, and, and I think that it's a big question for our culture. When I grew up, we did not have shootings in schools like we do, but now we have programs to deal with that. But how did this, how, was, how did we create the problem? That's what I ask myself. I didn't have that problem when I was growing up. And I think future generations have to live with the problems that we create sometimes, but we can learn not to create those problems if we can leave things the way they are. And in some cases, I think the environment needs to be protected and left as much natural as it can be. That might be the lesson of the future that we look back on and say, how did this happen? I, I know I'm getting kind of philosophical, but I'm trying to put those thoughts, share my thoughts with you all because those are the things I think about these days. Anyway, thank you for your job. I know how important it is, and I appreciate you being here. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other individuals interested in public comment? All right. Uh, with that, I believe entertain a motion for adjournment. It's been moved. All in favor, aye. aye. We are adjourned. Oh, oh, should we have discussed next meeting schedule? We have it, just don't we? Don't we have the next meeting in September? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.